moment to thank Greater Cleveland Audubon's uh, Mark Demian, who just spoke. He's done a wonderful job in coordinating today's program. And to uh, also to Bill Heck of Columbus Audubon, who has been a great help to me with the Zoom process. He's going to continue helping me throughout the talk today. Then I plan to tell a little bit about Black River Audubon Society and its founder, especially Jack Smith, who is also important to COLAC. Since these gatherings are really, I found, a great opportunity to network with other chapters, I will discuss Black River Audubon's history of success through collaboration, including with COAC. But to tell you the truth, since a few people around the, around the state really know where Black River Audubon is located, the first thing I would do is show you where you might be right now if it weren't for the pandemic. Right, next slide, please. Okay, here we see the map of uh, Audubon chapters throughout Ohio. It includes uh, those chapters active and COAC uh, currently, those that are not, and several that are no longer in existence. Black River Audubon, for those who don't know, which might be most of you uh, possibly, uh, Black River Audubon can be found near the center of Ohio's Lake Erie coastline. Uh, Bill, can you run the Curse, your cursor on it. It's the light blue chapter just west of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County. It's in the county of Lorraine. Its geographic district is you know, fairly small as you can tell, but it's almost exactly the same as that of Lorraine County, which encompasses the, almost the entire Black River watershed. And despite a history of major pollution in the Black River, the county has an excellent metro park system, including Sandy Ridge Nature Preserve, one of the prime locations in Northern Ohio for viewing water birds, raptors, and pastorines of all, of all species. And again, it's a place we would have visited just this morning. We would just be getting back from there if, we were, if it were not for COVID. Next slide. Black River Audubon was founded uh, by this man, Jack Smith. Some of you uh, may still remember Jack. Um, as a young man in the 1950s, Mr. Smith led uh, Sunday morning birding walks through Ely Wood Park, a surprisingly wild park near downtown Illyria. These, uh, these walks were very well publicized at the time and could draw up to 100 birders, amazingly. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine a bird walk for a chapter today that uh, has 100 birds showing up? By 1958, it was clear that Jack's birding enthusiasm and social skills had created enough avid birders to start what was then called the Illyria Audubon Society, later renamed for the river that cuts through the county. You can tell by this photograph just what a welcoming person Jack was. Under Jack's behind the scenes guidance, the chapter grew quickly to become an active and well-organized Ohio chapter. Later, he played a role in organizing the Ohio Audubon Council, or OAC, in the 1970s. After a period of dormancy in the early 21st century, OAC became our own COAC, which started up again in 2017. Some of our members, even here today, may uh, remember Jack for his gentle personality that served him well in bringing people together, both within the chapter he founded and across the state organization. He especially was noted for encouraging collaboration within and across organizational lines, a characteristic that still describes the activities of his chapter that he founded, and also of COAC nine years after his death. Next slide. Jack developed uh, partnerships with other organizations almost immediately, including those pictured in this slide. Lorraine County Community College, the city of Elyria, and the Western Reserve Land Conservancy, and many others. These, these are just a small sampling of the partners that we still work closely with today. 
Next slide. Jack also started the uh, partnership with Lorain County Community College. Since uh, 1999, we've been working uh, with the college on a 23 acre meadow, on preserving a 23 acre meadow on the campus. Our chapter encouraged the college to uh, refrain from mowing the lawn, mowing the area during breeding season to protect ground nesting birds such as meadowlarks and bobolinks. But we encourage them to definitely mow afterward to stop the development of trees in order to preserve it as a metal. In addition, we have continued to work to eliminate invasive plants from the metal area, all together with the help of the community college itself. Next slide. Now, early in the century, Jack purchased a small property near downtown of Lyria, and he later donated it to the city. But at the time of the purchase, the site was serving as a very bad informal dumping ground. People just dumped whatever there, uh, you know, whatever they could get away with it. And so, and it just sat there for years. Uh, Black River Audubon, together with volunteers from other groups, worked to clean it up. And Jack was able to enjoy the city's dedication of the park not long before his death in 2012. Later in 2018, our chapter won a Burke Plants for Birds grant from National and recruited its own members, Elyria High School students, as you see in this photograph that a photographer from National Audubon uh, took of, uh, of the project. Uh, Rotary Club volunteers, the Land Conservancy, and community residents all worked together to turn Black River Audubon Park, a city park, named after our chapter, into a passive nature preserve. Should be noted that this, um, you know, for, it's a good point to note that this diversity of supporting organizations helped us win the National Audubon Grant in the first place. And in 2018, it was considered one of the uh, best uh, grant applications that came in for those um, Burke Plants for Birds grants. Okay. Next slide. The next year, we repeated the success in winning another Burke Plants for Birds grant. This was it actually started as a Western Reserve Land Conservancy project that transformed worn out but historic farmland south of Oberlin into a gorgeous 30 acre meadow called the Oberlin Preserve. Our contribution with the help of many other organizations was the planting of several dozen trees that you, as you see here. This was only about half the number of people that were there that day. Um, we were planting trees in, uh, in two corners of, uh, of that meadow. Now, the Land Conservancy connection was first developed by Mr. Smith decades ago. Since then, we have helped that organization with a number of projects by writing letters of support for their land acquisitions, providing bird censuses for their grant applications, and in giving direct maintenance help as we did and are still doing with the Oberlin Preserve and other projects. Now, one thing I particularly want to emphasize is that my involvement with COAC has also helped the conservancy outside of land of Lorraine County. Because of my contacts with through COAC, I was able to get in touch with Linda Chen of Canton Audubon and Sherilyn Burns of Greater Akron Audubon, who were able to, to arrange bird censuses on land that greatly helped the land conservancy acquire properties in their areas. So, you know, Lorraine County, through co contacts with COAC, uh, were able, was able to help Western Reserve Land Conservancy, a regional um, uh, organization, to preserve land in other counties, not our own. To me, that's, um, you know, a striking, uh, a striking benefit that comes from uh, membership in COAC. Black River Audubon could never have assisted with these projects otherwise without the contacts of COAC. 
and its monthly board meetings and gatherings such as this one today. I think in this way alone, COAC justifies itself. I should add that other chapters such as Greater Cleveland and Greater, Mo, uh, Greater Mohican have also helped the Land Conservancy in its land, con land preservation work. Uh, the next slide, please. One other thing that we do uh, is we provide scholarships to Hog Island. To, and we award uh, these to individuals, science teachers, and naturalists with full scholarships to National Audubon's historic Hog Island summer camp. In the left-hand picture, you see one of the main attractions of going to Hog Island. Where, when we were doing introductions the first day when I went, um, not on a scholarship, I should point out, but I, I went there once uh, in a few years ago. And puffins turned out to be the main attraction that people were going there for. And I can see why after uh, viewing them there. This is the last day. This is the old historic building at um, Hog Island that goes back to like the 1920s or 1930s when camps first started. there. And uh, this was the last day, celebration on the last day. If I remember right, this is Pete Dunn sitting right here. So we got to meet some of the um, bigger names in uh, American birding. Uh, since 1988, we've uh, Black River has sent 40 over 40 educators and naturalists to broaden their knowledge through these camps. In 2020, we created a scholarship for teens who belong to the Ohio Young Birders Northeast Ohio chapter. Unfortunately, the pandemic led to the cancellation of last year's camps totally. But hopefully, the young lady who uh, won the Ohio Young Birders Scholarship that we provide will be able to attend this year. It looks like it's going to, they're going to go on a scaled down basis this season. Okay, next slide. Finally, Black River Audubon works with Lorain County Metro Parks and others to monitor hundreds of uh, boxes of cavity nesting birds that we have put up throughout the, throughout the county, including those of purple martins, kestrels, and next line, especially Eastern bluebirds. I love these photos, these, you know, first, uh, the first uh, hatchlings out of the, out of the eggs. But anyway, um, you will be hearing much more than I can describe from Penny Brandau, our Bluebird uh, Committee Chairperson in a few minutes. In ending my presentation, I would like to emphasize that COAC means collaboration which is the most efficient way to accomplish conservation projects. We could never have done these things just as Black River Audubon Society. And thankfully, Jack Smith got us started in that direction, of networking and collaboration. Thank you very much. And enjoy the rest of the uh, conference today. Okay, Jim, thank you very much. That is a great uh, quick talk about Black River and all the exciting things you're doing at Black River. We do have a question from uh, Constance Rubin. How do you monitor crestals? How do we monitor crest kestrels? Yes. Uh, to tell you, well, we, um, to tell you the truth, I'm not as familiar with the kestrel program as, as others in our, um, in our chapter. Um, is there, is more specific question. I mean, we, we go out there regularly, you know, we check to see if there are starlings or other birds that are taking over the, over the nest box. We try to uh, eliminate them, especially starlings if we can. Uh, it is a more difficult task, I think, in many ways uh, than, um, than, other, than monitoring other uh, birds. Uh, the nests are, you know, the boxes are much higher. You have to lower, you know, raise them and lower them regularly to check them out. Uh, and also, the Kestro program is um, maybe not quite, it's not having quite the same amount of success. Uh, the Kestros uh, are really endangered in many ways and are still, uh, you know, relatively rare in our county. We're making a really good faith effort to, um, to uh, project that program around the county further, and hopefully we'll be getting more success in the future. 
Okay. Uh, Kate. Mark, Mark, sorry, this is Bill. Could I interrupt? And I'm going to give you another benefit of COAC here because Columbus Audubon has good contacts with the people who are probably raising uh, the most kestrels in Ohio, certainly, and probably in the Midwest. And that's Dick Tuttle and his, part, his friend uh, Dick Phillips in Delaware County. We're happy to put anybody, Connie, uh, Jim, anybody in touch with Dick. Uh, he's had tremendous success with Kestrel. Great, that's, that's great to hear. This is, and this is exactly what I meant throughout my talk that these COAC conferences can provide. And COAC, uh, the regular monthly board meetings also. So thanks, Bill. I'll get in touch with you more about that. And I'll put our uh, Kestrel people in, in touch with, um, with you or with them. Thank you. Excellent. And anybody who else who wants to uh, uh, get in contact with Dick, just uh, throw a message in the chat. I'll get that by the end of the day and we'll get back to you. And Catherine stated, um, oh, it just flipped. I used to help monitor Kestrels with uh, uh, Cleveland Museum of Natural History many years ago. We used loop traps with mouse bait. I don't know if that is done anymore. I'm not familiar with that, I have to say. Anyone else have a, a suggestion on that one? Also, Kate uh, uh, said uh, Dick Tuttle was one of the first people that uh, BRAS uh, talked with. That's Black River Audubon Society. I apologize. First, I couldn't think what it was. So thank you, Kate, for that, that uh, Dick Tuttle. Um, Kate also stated uh, that Black River is installing, oh golly, somebody tell me what that word is, pro the wobbler, warbler boxes at the Overland Preserve wetlands. Oh, prothonotary boxes, Prothonotary. yes. Thank you. That's one of the new cavity nesting uh, uh, monitoring programs that we're having, but maybe uh, Penny Brandau can tell you more about that possibly than I can. Excellent. Okay, well, we're getting close to our next speaker, which is going to be Isabella, who is our Great Lakes representative, and she's also helping us host and, and handle all the technical aspects of Zoom and she is going to share with us about the Great Lakes. Uh, Isabella. Thank you so much, Mark, and thank you so much for having me here. Um, good morning, everyone. First, I would like to show off my new t-shirt, um, which is an Audubon t-shirt I received from the COEC leadership. Um, thank you so much, Bill, Mark, and everyone else, Jackie, Linda. I really appreciated the gift um, for helping with the past uh, COEC meeting. It was really a nice surprise, so I really appreciated that. My hope was to show it off at a face-to-face -face meeting, but of course, here we are again um, at another virtual meeting. Um, we also have a new announcement, probably, you know, more importantly, maybe than me showing off my t-shirt, um, but we had a um, a regional director transition. And I don't know if we wanted to do that now or if we wanna do that after I do my PowerPoint, um, but wanted to say that um, Bill Hack has been the regional director representing the chapter voice on National Audubon Society's board for, um, it's been seven years, Bill, correct? It's been seven years, two terms. Um, and now we have a new uh, bill successor. Her name is Erin Giese. Uh, she's from Wisconsin, from the Northeastern Wisconsin Audubon Society. And she's also a conservationist and a researcher. I know we have a video from Erin as a welcome, but Bill, did you want to say? Yeah. Sorry, are we ready uh, for that? Okay. Juggling these a little tricky. Here we go. Council of Ohio Audubon chapter. Let me get the share set up. What Bill is doing is setting up a recording that Erin uh, uh, was not able to be with us today, but she went ahead and gave us a recording. So here's Erin. Your Spring Council of Ohio Audubon Chapters meeting today. But instead, I wanted to at least virtually inter introduce myself to you all. So my name is Erin Giese, and I am the new regional director for the Great Lakes and Upper Mississippi region, and therefore a board member for the National Audubon Board of Directors. This role, as you might recall, was formerly filled, 
filled by Bill Heck, who you all know and love. <clears throat> I must say that I will be forever grateful to Bill. He has truly bent over backwards for me, getting me set up on joining the board of directors. He's met with me many times via Zoom, answered tons of my questions, sent me helpful emails, and provided tons of overall emotional support for me in this new role. So thank you again, Bill, so much for all you have done uh, filling this regional director role in the past and for your help in getting me started. I truly look forward to getting to know all of you in Ohio and across all of the Great Lakes region. A little bit about myself. I work at the uh, University of Wisconsin Green Bay's Conference Center for Biodiversity. I am the Senior Research Specialist, which is a little bit of a vague title, uh, but and I wear uh, many different hats in my job. But generally speaking, I manage the center's data collections. I coordinate field work, particularly for birds and anurans, which just refers to frogs and toads. Um, I'm also involved in writing reports and grants, uh, manuscripts, et cetera. Uh, some of the projects that I'm involved with include the Great Lakes Coastal Wetland Monitoring Program. We survey birds and anurans across Great Lakes Coastal Wetlands in the United States and Canada, along with dozens of other partners and lead investigators and other crews will survey fish, invertebrates, uh, water quality, and plants. And we all collect data in the same way across the Great Lakes. And we're hoping to um, uh, develop indicators using these uh, plants and animals so we can better understand Great Lakes coastal wetland health. I'm also involved with restoration efforts in Lower, in Lower Green Bay for fish and wildlife. And our latest project um, is, is to construct MODIS towers so that we can tag and track the locations of double-crested cormorants and common and Caspian terns, which uh, we have large colonies uh, of, of colonial water birds in Lower Green Bay. I also help with a project called Project SOAR, which stands for Snowy Owl Airport Rescue. And we, uh, our mission is to capture and relocate uh, snowy owls and other raptors from airports uh, and relocate them. And then I uh, also have a background in songbird banding and we do demonstrations uh, for that. Um, truly, I mean, my primary interest and focus in life is really doing anything and everything I can to protect biodiversity, um, paying particular attention to birds, though I do love all living things. It's just my, my training background and expertise really uh, revolves around birds. Uh, locally, I'm president of the Northeastern Wisconsin Audubon Board of Directors, and I'm the staff advisor to the Green Bay Audubon student chapter on our campus at UW Green Bay. Um, personally, I've been married uh, for eight and a half years um, and my husband and I uh, have really had the travel blog most of our lives together as a couple. We've uh, traveled all around the world and across the United States and our goal was to try to visit all seven continents before having a kid and we had the fortune of accomplishing that goal. And then finally, we, we had our baby boy um, in December of 2019. He's now uh, nearly 16 months old. Hard to believe how fast time flies. Um, our son is healthy, busy, really easygoing. You must get that from my husband uh, and very happy. And our lives are quite different now. And, but you know, a totally new and different adventure uh, that we really like. So I hope that gives you a little bit more background and perspective about myself. I, I really truly look forward to <coughs> being able to attend one of your fall council meetings and getting to know each of you better and cheers to you all. And I, I really hope, really hope you guys have a, a great day. So thanks so much. Great. So as you heard, um, Aaron is here definitely to play a supportive role. And I'm especially um, grateful for Bill's leadership in the Great Lakes region. Um, Bill was the regional director even before we had a network staff at Audubon Great Lakes. So I especially appreciate his leadership for setting up a lot of the connections and for traveling and taking the time to travel and visit chapters throughout the region, not only focusing on Ohio. Uh, so I really appreciate that. And I hope that with Aaron um, being now the new regional director that we can do even greater work um, with uh, Bill's um, past and experience. 
So with that, I will share a few updates, um, unless anyone has specific questions or reactions to Aaron's video. Okay, hearing none, I will then go ahead and share my screen. I also want to acknowledge that we have Leanne here with us from the Grange Center. Um, hello, Leanne, it's good to see you. Even though, so her, in terms of up even though her name looks like my name, but it's really Leanne over there. That's true. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bill, for pointing that out. I should probably help Leanne uh, rename her uh, so it's clear. Um, so for today's updates, um, we have Audubon's vision for the Great Lakes, update on the grants, webinars coming up, um, Great Lakes advocacy stories, and of course, the virtual national convention that will be coming up later in the summer. And I'll go into detail for all of these. So many of you, I'm sure, received the press release as Audubon uh, announced the new vision for the Great Lakes restoration. This is a really good slide that summarizes I think in the best way, um, we have 12 priority areas across the Great Lakes where we want to restore wetlands. And we define those wetlands um, through our spatial prioritization studies. And so those are the 12 that we would like to focus on in the coming years. If you've came to the chapter gathering or maybe attended past Great Lakes, Audubon Great Lakes presentations, this is not news. We've been talking about it in bits and pieces. And in some areas we already have uh, funding and able to do the restoration on the ground and other areas, it's going to take us maybe a few more years to be able to get funding and be able to start doing restoration work. And many of you, especially if you're a chapter on the basin, will definitely be an important partner on the local in the local community for us. But we, of course, want to work with everyone um, in restoring the wetlands. So we've shared already the press release. I've also sent out a chapter toolkit. If you would like to talk about the Audubon's vision to your community, we would really appreciate it. We have a newsletter, copy, social media templates that you could readily use, copy and paste, um, or modify if needed. So that's something that I can also follow up after the COEC meeting. Um, here I have just a few points in summary for the Audubon's vision. As I said, chapter toolkit, I shared it with all of you. Uh, it was last, last week or maybe now two weeks ago. Um, the first time that many of you probably heard about the Audubon vision in terms of the big announcement was at the chapter leader call in March, where we had our executive director, Michelle Parker, and communications director, Nicole Minadio, sharing about the vision. And then there would be a, um, a public journalist press conference on March 22nd. And that was the big day that we announced it to the journalists and we released the press release. And a lot of articles came out of that um, press conference and in the coming days and weeks. Uh, so I would definitely really appreciate if you have any questions, reach out to me. Um, and of course, use the chapter toolkit as a reference to talk more with your community about the Audubon's vision. And if you receive any media inquiries, please feel free to reach out to me. We can always help support um, with a staff interview or maybe work with you as a spokesperson and share more bullet points or uh, information about the uh, about the vision. And of course, this is not the end of conversation. We will continue uh, presenting on it. You're welcome to invite us to your chapter membership meetings to present in detail about the uh, Audubon's vision, but also uh, at the COAG meeting, we would love to present in detail in the future, uh, perhaps maybe in the fall, if, if there's room in the agenda. And I also will, will note that in this coming chapter leader call in April, uh, we will have Nat Miller, who's our Director of Conservation, presenting in detail on the full Audubon vision for the Great Lakes. So if you are interested to hear the full uh, presentation, please join us at the April chapter leader call, which will be April 21st at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. Note that Audubon Oh, Mark, were you going to jump in? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, 
I know that Audubon grants are an important uh, resource for many of you. Um, so I wanted to update you that for now, um, Audubon has decided to put them on hold, um, just still because we are under the pandemic. Um, but we will be focusing more on equity, diversity and inclusion grants coming fall. Um, there's hope to support consultant visits and having more deeper conversations with chapters and their boards on equity, diversity and inclusion. Um, so most likely project funding is on hold, but there will be opportunities to get funding for more EDI work, equity, diversity and inclusion. If your chapter is interested in doing more advocacy work, I highly recommend the Find Your Flock webinars. Um, also, um, there's a great resource uh, um, up on the website. You see two links here. Um, there's a great resource that you can use um, that helps you put together a campaign. It's a big, deep manual. And we're hoping, I'm working actually with Troy to distill that information and provide a ready to use a reference document that has maybe more like two or three pages that you could reference. So that's something that will be coming to you as well uh, soon. And then if you are interested to read some inspiration, we put together recently a Great Lakes advocacy document, um, a blog post, excuse me, um, where you could read about three stories of how advocates went to DC and advocated for the Great Lakes restoration. Uh, initiative. And then lastly, um, we have our virtual National Audubon Convention coming up. So please save the dates for July 16th through the 18th of this year. It will be again virtual on Zoom. Uh, it was supposed to happen in Tacoma, Washington. Right now, there's hopes to have that next year. Uh, we saved the conference room space for next year, um, but we'll see what happens with the pandemic, if that will be possible. But please save the date. And of course, you can always reach out to me with questions. You can see my email here on the screen, um, any of our social media, and I welcome your questions in the chat. I'll stop sharing my screen. Isabella, thank you very much. Uh, I do want to encourage all of our membership and, and chapters to reach out to Isabella. Um, use that email uh, that she has in the chat box. Uh, if, if you could share that screen again, that last screen, Isabella. Um, she is our go-to person any and every time I call her within 24 hours, she has answers for me, she has contacts for me. She is just, she's the everyone person. Uh, she is always there to help any of our chapters do anything. She will get you in contact with the person at national level or regional level that can help you. Um, Isabella is just, she, she's the Swiss knife of uh, Great Lakes. Um, she really does um, take pride in what she does and she's super, super helpful. And, she always can find an answer. If she doesn't have it right immediately for you on the phone or via email, she will research it and get back to you as soon as she can. And uh, she does know all the ins and out of national and who to get in contact with. Uh, secondly, I wanna really encourage all of you. I uh, did quite a bit of research on this um, Great Lakes Initiative and I think National's doing a great thing. And I think this is gonna be a continuing uh, um, initiative um, to help the Great Lakes. And because Ohio is, is one of the front runners in supporting healthy Great Lakes and everything, uh, I, I'd encourage even the chapters to the South uh, in Ohio, please get involved, see what we're doing. And it does impact and affect all of us. And so um, uh, if we are gonna have a recording of this uh, gathering, and so everything that Isabella just showed you will be on the recording again. And again, she will send you out anything you need via email. Um, super, super helpful and supportive. Um, two other things that um, Isabella has helped us in the past with and uh, uh, we're going to be getting involved with 
is national has has brought in some uh, support expertise support and they're going to be located in um, Columbus and we're going to learn more about that this afternoon so please hang in there we now have 30 participants welcome Meredith Dick Laura Heather uh, Catherine uh, Marilyn Laura uh, Jake Joy um, who else um, uh, if you're just joining us, please put in the chat box who you are, how you're affiliated with a local chapter, or if you're not affiliated with a local chapter, if you're just here to learn more about COAC and learn about chap Audubon chapters in Ohio, uh, please put in the, in the chat box uh, who you are and, and who you're connected with. Uh, if you're an officer or if you're just a member of a chapter, uh, please continue to use the chat box for that reason. Um, and now we're moving on to our next speaker. Uh, we have a very full schedule, so I apologize for speeding things up. If you have questions for Isabella, you can put them in the chat box and she will monitor that. She might not get to you right away, but she will try to get back to you uh, with, with a, a question answer as soon as she can. But welcome everyone again. Uh, my name is Mark Demian. I'm the uh, program chair. And Jackie Augustine, if you can wave your hand, and Jim Jablonski, there are two hosts. Um, uh, Great, uh, Black River and COAC are the uh, participating and, and hosting uh, organizations for today's gathering. Um, but if you have any questions or anything, uh, we do ask you to mute your uh, mic uh, so that the speaker has full full control of the of the. Of talking. And so our next um, speaker is hold on, I have to pop it up on my screen. Oh, golly. Is is Uh, is Penny Brandau. Penny and her husband Fritz have been coordinators for the Bluebird program of Black River Audubon in Loring County since 2012. It is a large active program with over 470 blue boxes, 31 trails and over 40 Bluebird trails. And monitor 40 Bluebird trail monitors help her, volunteer to help her with all of those 470 boxes. Penny has been on the board of Black River Audubon and the Ohio Bluebird Society and is currently editor of the OBS newsletter Monitor. What are some of the qualities that have made Black, Black River Audubon Society's Bluebird program successful? Penny will highlight five areas of importance in having a successful program and give illustrations and tips for others who lead Bluebird conservation nest box programs. Uh, welcome, Penny. We do have a recording of Penny's presentation. Uh, she had a little bit of a raspy voice, so she asked if we could uh, play a recording. But Penny is with us this morning, and she will ask, answer questions after the presentation. And now uh, Bill will be putting the uh, recording on our screen. First of all, I'd like to give you just a little background about our Bluebird program last year in 2020. We had 470 Bluebird nest boxes and those were on 32 different trails. We had 48 volunteer Bluebird trail monitors who managed those trails. In Last year, we had 834 Eastern Bluebirds pictured in the top left corner. 
and 1,268 tree swallows that fledged. Surprisingly, we had no black-capped chickadees who successfully fledged last year. Uh, although they typically do every year, we did have 218 house wrens and 10 Carolina wren fledglings in our program in 2020. So as you can see, the bluebird boxes have several species that nest in them. Uh, these are just uh, examples of the most prominent types that do nest in the boxes. So in this program, I'd like to talk about what has made Black River Audubon Society uh, the program successful. And I think the features that I am going to talk about are relevant to most successful programs. So I just wanna give some specific illustrations or examples of each of these uh, in our program. Vision and resources, we'll talk about first, and then knowledge and education, then organization, fourthly, communication, and last, dedication. The first feature I wanna talk about is the vision and resources. And of course, no program will ever come into existence without someone having a vision. Uh, in our case, uh, the gentleman who started Black River Audubon Society was Jack Smith. Now, he founded it in 1958. And Jack was, we were fortunate enough to know Jack for a couple years before his death in 2012. Uh, he was a quiet, uh, self-effacing, uh, generous man, always curious and learning. Uh, whether it was beekeeping or mushrooms or dahlias or birding, he was knowledgeable and always ready to teach or share. And so when he uh, established Black River Audubon Society and bluebird conservation was one of the important parts <clears throat> of the conservation goals of that organization. Uh, upon his death, the program was funded fully and generously by donations and budgeted allocations. And I know that's not the norm for most bluebird programs. Uh, usually fundraising is an important part of bluebird programs. It takes a lot of time and energy to provide for the needed program expenses. But because of Jack's vision and his resources, um, we have been a little bit more fortunate. These photos just show um, Jack's basement. He lived in a century home in Illyria and his basement was just uh, full of every kind of tool that might be needed to create nest boxes and other projects that he got into. Uh, the photo on the left shows how Jack would usually cut out the pieces for a nest boxes, the bluebird boxes, uh, the sides, the back, the roof, the front, uh, and have them all stacked up neatly in his basement work box, work area. And then he would invite volunteers to come to his home. We would go to the basement and put together these boxes. Uh, it was a, a lot of fun and we enjoyed um, being together and getting the chance to create something right there together uh, in his basement. This photo shows some completed bluebird boxes on the left and some completed kestrel boxes on the right. And then the second thing I want to talk about is knowledge. Um, according to the dictionary, knowledge is facts or information or skills about a topic that a person acquires through experience or education. So of course we need knowledge of bluebirds um, and also the other birds that might use the nest boxes. Um, the birds that I showed in the earlier slides, some, several different species will use these boxes. And some of the basic things that you need knowledge of having a technical issue and uh, hopefully uh, Bill will come back into the screen and uh, get the volume back on. Uh, hold on one minute please for the technical issue.
Bill? Yeah. Um, don't know what happened there. When I first started um, taking over after Jackson's staff, uh, I was very needed a lot of information. I it's very low in my knowledge. Uh, we had done Bluebird Trail Management only for one year, so I knew that there was so much that I didn't know. Uh, so the first thing I one of the first things I went to was experienced volunteers. Even before Jack passed away, you can see in this photo on this slide, the gentleman in green is actually Jack Smith. And beside him is an experienced trail monitor, Mike Smith. Um, and they were putting up a bluebird trail at Golden Acres Nursing Home in the Amherst area. And this trail was the first trail that I ever monitored and cared for. And I learned so much from these two guys. Uh, they, although they weren't related to each other, uh, they both had a wealth of experience and information and generously mentored my husband and I as we managed that trail in 2011. And then I wanted to talk about website resources. The first one that's listed is Cialis.org. And that's just an incredible website uh, if that was the only site I could recommend, uh, that would be my number one pick. It has hundreds and hundreds of pages of information related to every facet of bluebirding. So if you have a question, check out Ciala, and I'll bet you you can find the answer. Um, the second website is North American Bluebird Society. Uh, that's the national organization, and it has some great fact sheets. Um, along with a lot of other good information. Um, and then the third one is Nest Watch. That's managed by Cornell Lab of Ornithology uh, and is actually the site that we enter our nesting data into in the fall. And then the last two websites that I listed, uh, OhioBluebirdSociety.org. Um, they had a virtual conference this year, lots of great information, uh, free. Uh, just go to their website and you can see some great talks, uh, everything from house sparrows to other cavity nesters. And lastly, the BlackBirdAudubonSociety.org has a bluebird section in it and newsletters that I print are on there. So check out any of those websites to get more information. A third way I started acquiring knowledge about bluebirds was by networking with other bluebirders and birding organizations. So we mentioned that we had joined Black River Audubon Society in 2010, and it has a very active bluebirding program. Uh, we also then went on to join Ohio Bluebird Society. That's the state organization for bluebirders. And finally, we joined North American Bluebird Society, and that is for bluebirders throughout the United States and Canada. All of these organizations have member meetings and or conferences. Um, they have great websites, newsletters for the members. And for a nominal fee, I think you get so much benefit from joining these and supporting uh, the bluebird organizations. Of course, written resources like books or booklets are great things to put up in your hand. Uh, I love to hold a book and the one that's pictured, the Bluebird Monitor's Guide was one of the very first books that I acquired. Uh, I've read it through several times. And although it's no, not in print at this time, you still can buy it on Amazon at an inflated price. <laughs> uh, it originally was around $20. And the book to the right of that, The Beloved and Charismatic Bluebird, I would recommend also by Dean Rust. Um, Dean is the president of the Pennsylvania Bluebird Society. And uh, that book's a little bit more recent, uh, some new ideas in it. Both of these uh, books are around $20 originally, and I would recommend both of them. And then if you're looking for something smaller, the two booklets listed uh, shown below. Enjoying Bluebirds More by Julie Zikafus, and Bring Back the Bluebirds Even on Your Hand by Andrew Troyer uh, are great. For about $5, uh, 
Uh, they have just a wealth of information in this. And then research. Uh, I think we can get a lot of information and knowledge by doing research. It helps us learn what new ideas might work and which ones don't work. Uh, we did a research project one year to test the use of lavender under a nest. Once the eggs are laid, uh, we were looking to see if it reduced blowfly presence in the box. And that was based on a theory that we heard about in one of the NABS conferences in Canada. We've done studies on pairing versus single boxes on a trail um, or pairing a smaller box with a larger box as pictured on the left uh, to see if bluebirds preferred smaller interior. Uh, the picture on the right shows um, a study that we did uh, based on a theory that gourds are preferred by tree swallows if they're available. And we used that premise to pair a gourd nest box with a wooden one in order to increase bluebird occupancy on a few trails that had heavy tree swallow nesting percentages. So research is interesting uh, to find out what works and what doesn't work and to get more information about the topic. And then also we acquired knowledge by best practices. Um, <clears throat> best practices are methods or techniques that have been generally accepted as superior to any alternatives uh, because they produce results that are superior to other ones. It's commonly thought of as the gold standard. So we try to seek out and follow best practices regarding, um, like pictured on the photo on the left, um, the stovepipe predator guard. Um, that's a best practice. Uh, it's known that they actually do effectively reduce losses of the eggs and the bluebird nestlings in boxes uh, due to ground predators. So we try to put the Kingston predator guards on more and more of our boxes every year. We also follow best practices by using vanner traps uh, as pictured on the photo on the right. Uh, those traps are live traps and they assist with house barrel control. We do not allow house sparrows to successfully nest in our boxes. And a third thing that's pictured um, above the house on the left, you'll see some mylar strips. And those are called sparrow spookers. They're passive aggressive uh, <laughs> deterrents for controlling house sparrows from going into your box. Uh, and if you use them according to guidelines, they're very effective, a 24-7 passive method of deterring house sparrows. And the third feature I want to talk about was organization. Um, obviously, the bigger your organization gets, the more important it becomes uh, to have the details and, and several different aspects of your program well organized. <clears throat> We started off with just physical resources uh, with 470 nest boxes on so many different trails. Uh, it's important to know how many we have currently, how many need to be replaced uh, to always have inventory of them. So to know your nest boxes, how many poles you have. The picture on the lower left is the sparrow spookers that we made over one winter. Uh, predator guards. Uh, and even drills, pictured on the bottom right, is a new drill that Black River Audubon bought for us. It is a power, gas powered drill, um, pole driver that helps us drive the poles into the ground. Makes it a lot easier. Um, and then pictured on the top right, my husband in his garage, and he built all of the nest boxes now, sometimes with help, usually by himself. Uh, he loves doing that. Uh, we don't do it in our Jack's basement anymore, but this has become the new area for building boxes for Black River Audubon. And pictured in the center, a couple of bluebird trail monitors and my husband uh, getting ready to go out and establish a couple new boxes on one of their trails in Elyria. So knowing what resources you have uh, is really important. And then organizing photos. Um, I think photos are so important. Uh, we use them in our newsletters. Uh, this slide shows two years that I made 
use photos from the trail that year to make slideshows and I added music to it and created DVDs. And uh, they were nice. The uh, monitors received these as gifts that fall. And uh, just a reminder of the things that had happened that year and who was in our program. Um, photos are great to share just by printing them out or sending them by email or maybe putting them on social media. I almost always have a camera with me while I'm walking a trail or holding a presentation or doing a meeting. Uh, people would like to see photos of themselves and of their beloved bluebirds. So if you organize them, they could be a real asset to your program. And then meetings. We hold a lot of meetings. Um, some are public, uh, as pictured in these pictures. Uh, the top left and the right photos uh, are meetings that were held at local libraries. Uh, those are usually free. They don't charge you anything to hold meetings there. Uh, and these meetings are usually held every spring to teach Bluebird basics. People in the public can just sign up and register, and the number is limited only by the size or capacity of the rooms. The bottom left corner is a group of homeowners who decided that they wanted to have a Bluebird information for their housing development. They wanted to partner with, Blue, with Black River Audubon and ask us to come in and teach them how to correctly establish bluebird boxes and monitor them and control house birds. And then the top right is a group of college students from a nearby local college, Lorain County Community College, um, and they did community service with Black River Audubon, um, came over and learned things about bluebird conservation, and then in turn helped us as we established new trails and did maintenance on other trails. So it was a great partnership with them. Um, so with every meeting, you know, the, there's organization of details like the attendance sheet, name tags, uh, pens. We usually have refreshment tables uh, and also a show and tell table. So there's a lot of details for public meetings. And then we have meetings for our new volunteers. When we get new trail monitors, uh, they go through a training period before they go out on the trail. And this shows last year's five ladies who joined us. We got in under the wire before COVID hit. Uh, this meeting was held at our home um, and it lasted about two and a half hours. During that time, the ladies get a handbook and we watch a couple of educational Uber DVDs. They get a chance to <clears throat> have some hands on on the nest boxes, um, what the traps look like, uh, how the spookers work. They learn how to make a replacement nest, uh, how to trap a sparrow, and even how to pack a trail bag. So we share light refreshments and we just get to know each other during this meeting. We also have a meeting similar to this for people who volunteer to do our data entry in the fall. Um, so meetings for new volunteers. And then of course meetings for our trail monitors. We have spring and fall meetings for our trail monitors. These pictures are the uh, spring meetings. As you can see by the photo on the left, uh, we've outgrown our basement. So we held this in a local library near our house. And it's just a great time to get together, um, meet new monitors that have joined our group. Uh, we pass up materials, usually have some sort of um, talk and informational discussions. And they just get a chance to get to know each other again and connect. Uh, the photo on the right shows some sparrow spookers that are passed out. Uh, fresh grasses for replacement nests, and then the paperwork that they'll need to do their trail monitoring. The fall meetings uh, pictured in these photos are usually outdoor potluck meetings, and uh, we talk about season, uh, what went well, we develop plans for the following year, and we enjoy each other's culinary specialties. Uh, usually there's a 
small gift to send to each monitor as just a just a small thank you. Obviously, there's just no way to repay them for all of the work and the dedication that they've shown during the year. But we like to let them know that we really do appreciate them. Um, my husband likes to do wood turning. And you can see in the bottom right photo, he made honey dippers one year. And then we added uh, bags of local honey um, to pass out as a gift. Uh, also during this fall meeting, we do a worksheet. You can see the poster board uh, on the bottom left. And that has a listing of every one of our trails. Each monitor during this meeting gets a chance to talk about their trail um, and sort of give us some ideas of input of what they would like to see change or different or better um, for their trail for the following year, whether that's moving boxes or adding boxes uh, or sometimes taking them down. Um, those get written down and that becomes our worksheet for the following year. And then of course the outreach to the public. It can be something like the Girl Scout troop, pictures on the left, who came to us, they had a school garden and they actually wanted to put up a bluebird box in that box, garden. But after we uh, talked with them and they learned more about bluebirds, they decided to focus instead on putting in bird feeders and a bird bath and a, a chickadee box instead of bluebird boxes. And their photo on the bottom left shows them during their opening day for their garden, uh, having a welcome sign up for the visitors who came to see the, the changes and the improvements they had made to their school garden. Um, top right, we have a thank you to a local library, just a children's bluebird book that was gifted to them and appreciation. And then uh, the bottom right shows one of our monitors who every year posts uh, a photo on a sheet of paper with the listing of how many uh, birds fledged from that trail that year. And it's just a, <clears throat> a nice yearly report of that town's bluebird trail. And as people enter the park, they can see updates on the trail each year. So it's just an outreach, uh, just a nice way of letting people know they matter. And then of course, organization of information. Uh, this is a lot of things, <clears throat> everything from the volunteer contact information spreadsheets of our monitors. Those get updated every year and they include things like uh, the monitor's name, what trail they are managing, their address, email, phone numbers. Uh, and so that's put on spreadsheets <clears throat> and each monitor gets a copy of it. So if they need to com communicate with the other monitors, they have it readily available. And of course, organizing meeting details, um, organizing monitor notes. That takes a lot of information right there. As each monitor is checking each box on your trail at least once a week and often during the heavy seasons, twice a week. Um, those notes get turned in in the fall um, to be entered into data, uh, into, into the data base of NestWatch. And then the photo on the right shows uh, example of what our Google Earth uh, maps are. Um, NestWatch requests that we give GPS locations for each box. So we do latitude and longitude <clears throat> for each nest box. Uh, includes the height of the box from the ground, the size of the opening, the direction it faces, uh, what the habitat around it is. And those get put onto like maps like this one is illustrating here, <clears throat> and all of that information is also organized and kept on these um, spreadsheets. And then just contact information. Sometimes, you know, you need to know who the local wildlife rehabber is in your area to have his information handy, or even just a maintenance person of one of the local parks who helps cutting back the grass around the boxes. Those are important informations to have. And then we organize reports. Um, there are several types of reports that our program does. Uh, I'm not sure what others do, but we have a June 1st count 
And that's usually uh, each monitor gives me a list of what is in the box on that day, <clears throat> whether it's eggs or chicks, or if there's some that have already fledged. And that information can be compared to prior years uh, and gives us an idea of how the nesting is going that year. We do a more complete end of season total summary, uh, which turns into a six to eight page spreadsheet. And that gives us <clears throat> information about each trail and what species, the number that they fledged, often how many eggs or young were on that trail and cumulative totals. Um, the yearly fledgling report gets turned into the Ohio Bluebird Society each fall. And then, of course, organizing the reports for Nest Watch uh, entries and the reports to them. And fourthly, communication. Um, communication is so big, it's, uh, and it's involved in all of these other features, actually. How to recruit new volunteers. Uh, when our program, <clears throat> we do have a publicity chairperson who advertises our needs in local newspapers. Uh, other ways to communicate the need for new volunteers is by word of mouth, um, by the Bluebird newsletters that I write every two months, um, sometimes by personal recommendations. Of course, uh, the website advertises it. <clears throat> and then communication by with our monitors. Uh, that goes all the way from the initial training in service um, to the spring meetings that we have every year and the fall end of season meetings. Um, we communicate with them through the monthly, the bi monthly newsletters. Um, and then with the public, communicating through the seminars that are held each spring. And then all of these areas lead to lots of emails, phone calls, and even home visits. Uh, as ways of communication. In the photo on the right, a, a couple attended one of our public seminars about Bluebird basics a couple of years ago, and they were so excited and wanted to put up boxes. So they asked us to come to their home and give them some information of what could be a good location for some boxes. So we were happy to go, uh, got to know them better, and they ended up putting up three boxes which fledged over 20 bluebirds that year. So they were beyond happy, and we were due. And then the last feature I wanted to talk about was dedication. Um, it would be wrong to not <coughs> mention that there are negatives to any program, any bluebird program. Um, the disappointment of failed nests or losses of the birds, um, that's always Gut wrenching sometimes to find uh, the natural consequences of weather <clears throat> or predators on the birds, uh, but it's, it can be really hard to overcome sometimes. And weather, you know, we're out walking from the freezing winds of March <clears throat> through the blistering heat of August. Um, bugs, ants in the boxes, ticks in the tall grasses blow flies under nests, <clears throat> sometimes wasps in the boxes, and then even environmental challenges like the weeds, um, briars, mud that you encounter by walking a trail. Human vandalism can be one of the most disappointing <clears throat> negatives of doing a bluebird trail. Uh, sometimes it's very intentional. Uh, we've had people who knocked over boxes and um, beat predator guards with sticks. <clears throat> Sometimes it's not intentional, like pictured in the top right, uh, someone, a park employee, accidentally bumped into one of the boxes while mowing grasses. Um, but the vandalism and the damage uh, requires more work and more effort to replace uh, the boxes or straighten the poles and I think probably the <clears throat> most common negative in bluebirding is dealing with the invasive species, house sparrows. Uh, no one enjoys the control that needs to be made, uh, but it is a very necessary evil. But then again, there's so many positives to a bluebird program. 
for me, the wonder of personally seeing the nesting of the miracle of nesting, uh, like the little eight black capped chickadees in the top left, <clears throat> or mom bluebird gathering grasses to build a new nest. You can see on the right top uh, a full clutch of six bluebird eggs, and then the beauty of the tree swallow nest in the bottom left, or the wonder of seeing the bluebirds ready to fledge. <clears throat> Another real positive of a bluebird program is the regular exercise and fresh air you get from just walking your trails. Since we're checking the trails every five to seven days from August 1st, I mean April 1st to August, we're walking regularly <clears throat> and different trail lengths require different amounts of time to walk. Some of them can be as brief as 30 minutes and some as long as two to three hours, depending on how many boxes are on that trail. And then the positives of being part of a social group. Um, we <clears throat> enjoy each other's company. We are birds of a feather and we flock together. And uh, when something good happens, all of us are happy. And when we have uh, something bad happen in our groups, uh, we all are sad for each other. We enjoy fellowshipping around the table, enjoying food and, and drink, and just having a good time together. And the common goal of bluebird conservation brings us together. And then learning and seeing new things. Uh, my husband and I joined North American Bluebird Society, and that's enabled us to travel to places that we normally wouldn't have gone to. Uh, the top left photo shows us with our 16-year-old grandson back in 2014 when we went to Boise, Idaho. And our grandson had a chance to hold a bluebird, mountain bluebird nestling in his hand uh, right before it was banded. That was just an amazing experience. Um, and one year we went to Quebec, Canada, uh, where we one of the field trips was a tour of a lavender farm. Uh, another year we went to Ellis Bird Farm in British Columbia. Each of these was just amazing. We got to see local uh, attractions, heard from great speakers, um, saw some interesting things, and learned a lot. And last year we went to Kearney, Nebraska, uh, to the Great Platte River area where we saw sandhill crane migration right before COVID shut us down. And then of course, the sense of fulfillment and purpose. Uh, at the end of the day, it's not about what you have or even what you've accomplished. It's about who you've lifted up, who you've made better. It's about what you've given back. Never doubt this quote from Margaret Mead says, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. It is the only thing that ever has. Um, and that's so true. I wanted to finish the presentation with just a short little video clip of the bluebird box in our backyard. And this little nestling is soon to become a fledgling. Mom and dad are calling to him from the nearby wire. And this is one of the joys of bluebirding. And he's off. And I'd just like to thank you again for inviting me. His brothers and sisters are gonna fledge soon. Thank you for inviting me to today's program. And I wish you bluebirds. Thank you, Penny. Wow, a great presentation. Really, really good. I, I'm going to listen to that and look at that three or four more times once the recording comes out. Um, also, thank you for all that contact information. We do have a couple of minutes. So um, Scott is going to ask you three or four of the biggest questions. But there were so many questions. I was watching the chat box. Please, if you'd be available during the lunch period and um, we could communicate with you, if you could wave to everybody, there's Penny and, and she's available to answer questions at lunchtime, but we're gonna ask you three <coughs> of the big questions. Scott's gonna um, kind of sort through them and pick uh, three or four of the most important questions. Okay, so the first question comes from Sherilyn Burns. Uh, it said, did you keep the Bluebird Trail continuing during COVID at the nursing home you mentioned?
Penny, unmute, unmute yourself. Down at the bottom right or bottom left. At the bottom left, you'll see your screen. It'll put your cursor. Okay, there. Yeah, the host had to unmute me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I wasn't able to do it by myself. Um, so can you tell me the questions that you wanted to say again, Scott? Uh, so Sherilyn Burns asked, um, did you keep the trail going at the nursing home you mentioned during COVID? Unfortunately, that particular trail was on county, Lorain County property, and it was being offered up for sale when they closed the nursing home. Um, so we had to close down that trail and it's no longer in existence. Uh, the property is up for sale. Yeah. Okay. Uh, second question was, and, and this may be a future thing, is that will there be a Bluebird Basics class this spring or in the future here? Unfortunately, because of COVID, uh, we aren't able to hold public classes this year. Uh, I would much prefer a public class over a Zoom meeting. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, as more people get vaccinated or the COVID, um, you know, diminishes, we'll be able to start classes again for the public and with signups like we did in the past. Okay. Uh, from Jackie Augustine, from Jackie Augustine, uh, the question was, what are the results of your research? Did lavender help with parasites? And were gourds preferred over wooden boxes by tree swallows? Um, well, the, regarding the lavender study, uh, we had a limited number of monitors who undertook all the parameters for the study. So it wasn't a large result, um, but it, it was positive. We had no blowflies in the boxes that had lavender, um, but I would be hesitant to say that it will prevent blowflies because we didn't have a very large study that year. Um, and as far as the gourds with the tree swallows, yeah, I think the tree swallows definitely go for the gourds. Uh, we have been able to increase the bluebird occupancy on three of our trails by pairing uh, a gourd with a regular box and the tree swallows always go to the gourd 95% uh, of the time. And that leaves the paired box open for bluebirds to take over, uh, which they do uh, in most of the cases. So yeah, that was, that was very successful, uh, that theory really proved out in the studies that we've done. Great, thank you. Um, well, the last question would be uh, from Marlene. Is there a map that shows the location of your bluebird trails? Uh, well, if you go to Cornell Lab of Ornithology's Nest Watch, uh, it shows the location of boxes and trails throughout the country. Um, you won't probably be able to see specifically our boxes, but you can see little red dots that there are a lot of boxes uh, in Lorain County. I person when I log into NestWatch uh, with my username and password, I can see each individual box and can access information on each box then through the NestWatch program. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Scott, this is Linda. There was one other question I wanted to say. Connie Rubin from Canton, she was asking how long do the um, nest boxes uh, last on average? How many years about? Well, we build our boxes with um, rough sawn cedar and it's like one inch, but it's really like seven eighths of an inch, I guess. So that's a really nice durable insulating material to use. And those boxes last around 10 years um, sometimes if they start to crack a little bit, um, you know, we use a little silicone caulking on them to keep them watertight. Um, the roofs are usually the first part to go. So because we, our boxes are pretty uniform in design, uh, it makes it easier to change out a roof um, in the field than it would be if they were a mis mishmash of boxes. Uh, so the roofs will be replaced maybe once during that 10 years. <clears throat> and then the box itself will probably go down by the time 10 years has gone by. My husband just made 48 new boxes this, this month. So that's about one tenth of our program. Uh, so we'll be putting up a lot of new boxes here soon and have been already. Yeah. And then one other question, Nancy Howell is asking if um, 
the uh, birds are banded, whether they're adults or fledglings or, you know, chicks. I wish we had a bander in our program <clears throat> to do the bluebirds and the tree swallows, but we don't. Um, we do have a, we borrow a bander for the Kestrel program for Black River Audubon Society. Uh, and so they come and band the Kestrels, uh, but unfortunately we don't have someone to do that. That would be great. They would be really busy in May and June. <laughs> well, Penny, thank you. And there's a lot more questions. And so um, hopefully everybody will hang around. Uh, we are going to move on to our, uh, uh, to our breakout session. But uh, again, Penny, it was so informative. I, I, I can't wait to review it again. So as soon as we can get the recording out, Anybody who's interested uh, is going to be able to see her recording again and, uh, and all her contact information. Uh, so thank you again, Penny. It was oh, fantastic. And seeing that uh, brand new chick taking its first flight was really awesome. So thank you, Penny, very, very much. You're welcome. OK, um, we're going to move on. Um, we're now about 10 minutes um, late getting started with our breakout sessions, but I'm going to um, pass the mic on to Jackie Augustine, who is going to explain how this is going to work. And then we're going to have the breakout session. And it is going to run over because we it, this is supposed to last approximately 40 to 45 minutes. But we will keep um, on schedule because at lunch, we'll, we'll cut back on our lunch period break uh, of nothing. So um, Jackie Augustine. Hello, uh, welcome everybody. Um, I am Jackie Augustine, the president of the Council of Ohio Audubon Chapters. And um, I just wanted to have this breakout session. So one thing that we kind of miss in this COVID is being able to see and talk to other people. So this is your opportunity to see and talk to other people. In a minute, um, you're gonna see something pop up that will ask you to join a breakout room. And when you see that, go ahead and hit join. When you get to the breakout room, um, please unmute your microphone and show your video. And this is where you get to talk to other people in, in small groups. There is going to be a moderator in each breakout room, and the moderator will help, will ask you to introduce yourself, but then uh, kind of moderate a discussion. And the winning uh, category for discussion is what are some strategies for developing officers? So you're going to talk about how you develop officers in your own chapter and maybe a different group, and how do you, how do you get leaders in your chapter? So that's the topic. The moderators will make sure everybody gets a chance to talk and then we'll come back. Um, I want to try and stay on schedule. So why don't we come back at about 1150 and um, the moderators will just uh, tell everybody what was discussed in their room. Uh, I think that's it. Do you have any questions? Please, um, let's keep between five to seven people per room. We have a total of five rooms, I think, uh, Isabella. That's right. And I'm actually not seeing Nancy Brandage, um, who is one of the facilitators of the group. She's, okay, on, she's here. Um, under what name? Nancy Brandage. Okay, maybe I'm not. Oh, I see. Okay. I got two Nancys confused. Great. <laughs> Thanks Excellent. so much. I'm setting this up and we will be breaking out shortly. Okay, so hit the join button when you see it. Yep, so everybody pick a room and if there's more than five to seven in your room, please jump to a different room so that everybody gets a chance to talk.
don't tell me we're the first ones back. It looks that way, doesn't it? Well, we can continue our discussion. I think we can. Do you have anything else to say there, Nancy? Um, I don't think so. Again, we'll see. It's going to be interesting to see what the other breakout rooms will have discussed. Um, well, Sal, uh, um, um, we have. I think we yeah, lost Sally. Oh, Sally oh, stayed okay. in the room. Oh. So I tried to help Sally come back. Hey, there's Sally. Trying to rescue her. <laughs> there we go. Are you is Sally unmuted? Or there we go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So how do you how do you since nobody's here, how do you actually convince other people to what do you do to get people to become officers? Anything special, Sally? Well, like I said, we we do advertise. Uh, we yeah. have got a couple people that way um, by asking through our newsletter, and we do put it in the newspaper that okay. anyone who might be interested. Um, it, looks, it looks as though the groups are coming back now. Okay. So. Oh, there they are. Yeah. Uh, okay, I floated. I floated between a few rooms. Um, and, Can uh, you close the breakout rooms, Isabella? Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> 55 seconds, everybody will be forced back into the main room, which is great. Uh, this has worked out really well. Um, I'm very uh, excited to hear what everybody has to say. Um, so we'll, we'll wait a minute, but you guys are willing to chat with each other until everybody shows up because we it says that we now have 14 participants. So uh, we had a total of 30 people before we left. Um, one other quick administrative thing. Um, uh, let's go ahead and run a minute or two over because I think all the, the three rooms I went into all had great information. So we're gonna run over lunch, but is that a problem keeping everybody in the room or whoever needs to take a break goes and takes a break, but everybody else stays? I'd like to keep on schedule as much as we can. So everybody gets a minute. Here, they're coming back, Mark. Yeah, it looks like we have just about everyone back, I think. Go ahead, Jack. Lead the charge. Sounds great. Welcome, everybody. Um, hopefully you had great discussions. I'm going to now call on the moderators to give us a, a minute or two summary of what you talked about in the room. So let's start with Liz Woodle. Okay, Liz is muted. Okay, our group had some expertise in our midst, so that was really pretty neat. Um, but we did have some age diversity and uh, that was good too. One of the things we all kind of agreed on is um, finding leadership. Perhaps you need to look beyond your old um, um, your old board and your in your membership and go out there and do some outreach and and, and lead and inspire others to uh, get involved. Whether that's um, we need to look at a diverse. Uh, offering in our population that we may have not thought of before. And this could include um, uh, some gender diversity, some age diversity. Uh, my group that used to be all um, between 20 and 35, that's definitely not the case anymore, although it's better lately. Um, but also um, disability, people with disabilities and uh, people of different races or types and so let's really go out there and get to know the people in our community. How that needs to be done, I'm not sure yet. Another thing we um, looked at is um, offering training to people as they uh, get involved. And so uh, whether there's an actual form of training on, on a uh, position on your chapter of uh, uh, leadership, 
uh, that's done in-house by former leaders in the group or within a foundation or another civic organization that offers leadership training. So somebody, if they're not sure what to do or what you're talking about, they can get some great training and be better able to take off on that endeavor when they come. So I'll just cut that off short because there's going to be lots of good ideas. <laughs> Sounds great, Liz. Thank you. Uh, Heather, why don't you report on your room? Hi, everybody. I'm Heather Farrington. Uh, our group kind of talked about two ends of the spectrum, um, both mentoring young people and bringing young people into the boards and um, into the leadership of our organizations, um, not only for uh, the benefit of our individual chapters, but also for preparing these young people to go out and be environmental advocates and prepare them to be of service no matter where they end up, if they decide to stay local or if they move on after graduating from their uh, college programs or whatever. Um, so bringing in young people and taking advantage of the perspective of younger generations is great. Um, but then we also talked about how chapters can benefit from people who are older and have more experience and have backgrounds in things like business or uh, management skills that they can use um, in an official capacity in our boards, things like accountants or attorneys or business leaders, um, that we could tap into those resources um, to better manage our chapters. Um, also, one of the things that we brought up, um, a lot of chapters tend to try and recruit internally for board members and for officers, um, but we need to do a better job of recruiting from the community and making our presence known in our local communities and bringing new members in um, and giving them the opportunity to voice their opinions and have opportunities to serve on our boards and in our uh, chapters. Uh, so I think that was sort of the high points of what we talked about. Hopefully I hit everything for my group members. Sounds great. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Nancy Brundage. Need to no. there you go. Okay. Um, talk about uh, one of the ways is to bring people in through projects. If we have projects, then we can get them involved and then evolve them into leadership. And also just to ask people, would you like to be on the board? Uh, would you like to be on head of a committee? Something like that. And um, one of the suggestions was that we would have a notebook that could be taken and passed on, done and passed on to the uh, other groups and uh, to upcoming uh, leaders. So they have an idea what, what this is going to entail, uh, what the history and uh, uh, different parts of the organization are all about. And another one is that we need to bring in some technical people. Uh, so many of us are having some problems in this COVID uh, trying to find people to manage websites and uh, uh, put in newsletters and uh, keep uh, Facebook pages going. So uh, those are basically some of the things we talked about Great. Thank you, Nancy. Now we'll go to the other Nancy, Nancy Hull. Oh, thank you so much. And, and I appreciate the folks that were in the group. Uh, we had uh, Canton Audubon represented, Black River Audubon, and Western Cuyahoga. And uh, I, I am jotting down some of the ideas that are already been presented. Um, one of the things that that has worked for some of the couple of chapters is simply calling members um, and asking, yep. So like Nancy Brundage says, a simple ask of the people who uh, are, are part of your, your chapter. Um, advertising through the newsletters, word of mouth um, has worked. And we did discuss, uh, you know, do projects help to increase uh, the, the, uh, your, your chapters uh, being out there? And 
uh, perhaps, uh, although, you know, with Bluebird projects and things, people, people really get excited about projects. So uh, I, think, I think projects probably will help uh, get people interested, maybe involved. And uh, then we also did hit that membership diversity. Um, and again, it wasn't just people of color, uh, it was you know, people in different economic backgrounds, younger people. I like the tech thing too, Nancy Brundage, that's a, a great idea because yes, there's a lot of people out there that are having trouble uh, with the, the tech uh, aspect of things. Um, and so uh, younger people, uh, the, the wisdom of the older folks that are in the, on the board, uh, the, the projects, uh, simple asks, and, um, and, and again, just getting out uh, good emails. I did ask, you know, how many of the chapters have job descriptions? I put that in air quotes because, of course, it's not a job, but it is a job. Um, and yes, um, uh, the chapters seem to have job descriptions that list things that people need to, to be aware of as a board member and or possibly a uh, uh, one of the leaders, uh, president, vice president. So, so again, a lot of the same things that many of the other uh, groups have, have mentioned, but um, no, nothing that's uh, quick and dirty and said, yes, this works for us, but there looks like there's a lot of opportunities for, for, for uh, getting folks involved. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, our group had some people that newly joined their local chapter and they emphasized how they felt honored or felt uh, encouraged to be asked. And so um, we again talked about networking within, uh, you know, within the, the contacts we have. We talked about, again, having well-defined short-term opportunities, like we're gonna meet one day or we're gonna meet three days and do this one thing. And that's how they start people involved or ask them to be on a committee and then work their way up to a leadership role. Um, we also talked about the, the how-to manuals that it, it really is explicit, like, okay, if you're treasurer, it's gonna take this much time. Um, but one thing that I think we talked about that others didn't is volunteer recognition, having some way to recognize your volunteers, whether that be a, a get together or certificates or some other thing. Um, so it sounds like we had a lot of good conversations in the breakout rooms. Is there anything anyone would like to add that they think is important that wasn't mentioned here? You, you know, one thing since we're at the COAC meeting is that we, I hope we are thinking about how chapters can share not only programs and speakers and whatnot, but, but volunteers. And when I say that, chapters, many chapters are doing many of the same things, not just the Bluebird program or whatever, but also just the routine things that chapters need to do. So for instance, if we talk about job descriptions, can we share those? And if we talk about uh, projects, uh, if we talk about um, something like buying chap insurance, liability insurance for your chapter, why do we all have to do it separately? Now we may have to have separate policies, but why do we have to actually go through the same process 15 times? So when we talk about COAC, I think we have you know ways that we can share our volunteer uh, both procedures and some of the work that the volunteers do might be shareable. Yeah, and I know um, if you haven't been on the COAC calls that find them very helpful and you know, a particular example that, you know, my chapter is we were going to redo our bylaws. And so I just went to a, a COAC meeting and said, hey, who has bylaws and constitution they'd be willing to share. And um, I got a bunch from uh, several different chapters and it was really easy to um, find one that fit our needs and modify it, you know, change the name and a couple things here and there. And we had a, um, and so it was a lot easier that way. So I am, you know, you took the great first step by joining this meeting today. Hopefully you, you now know some other people in a different chapter. You, you um, 
and you know come back in an hour. So we're going to go and switch to our hour lunch break. As I understand, there's going to be some uh, a little video, and then at 12:30 there's going to be um, breakout rooms. And so you know <laughs> this is virtual, but we wanted to mimic that idea of sitting at a table with someone that you don't know and talking to them at the table. So in a hat, go get your lunch. And in a half an hour, there'll be breakout rooms that you can join and just have a, a passive conversation, not anything in particular at, at 1230. And we'll, the formal meeting will start back up again at 1. One quick thing before we leave, if everybody could put on their video, if, if uh, you're capable to put on your video, we would like to take screenshots of everybody that's here. So if for one, one or two minutes, you turn on your video so we get everybody's picture. It's and our group photo smile. time. Smile. And smile, please. <laughs> and hold that awkward Our spot. Picture. We got a couple board. Is there anybody else still on their in their seat? Please <laughs> put on your video. If you not, can. if you're not able to, then you're gonna we just have your name. <laughs> this is making faces. I think we got it, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy see, your lunch. See you at, after lunch. You're welcome to stay on. We're going to have uh, pictures of native plants and a few other pictures. And then at 1230, hopefully we're going to set up another set of break rooms. And what you can do when you're in a, in a breakout room, you can leave that room and pick another room. I did that uh, during the breakout. And so you are capable of moving to another room, especially if nobody wants to talk in the room you're in. Have a good lunch. Take care. See you at 1230.
So Liz, what are you what are you having for lunch? Liz, unmute. I'm unmuted now. Okay. I, I had cheese and crackers. I'm having a, a, a spiral ham sandwich. Oh, that sounds great. I'm not supposed to have that till tonight after vigil, but I decided I'm going to break the rules. I'm 62. There you go. How bad could it get? <laughs> Is that a, is that a like a a goal on this day like a abst abstaining kind of thing? Yeah, you abstain until after the vigil. Oh, I don't remember having a vigil, but I know we abstained a lot when I was a kid. <laughs> oh, all the time. Man, yeah, it's, it's it's like every other week. <laughs> this is Nancy. What's the vigil? The Easter Vigil Mass, we, we have the Vigil Mass starts right at dusk and goes for about three hours. Oh, wow. So do, you, do you start going to church on Wednesday? Yes. Yeah, we, we, Wednesday, Wednesday you have what we call the um, Holy Oils Mass. And then Thursday uh, we have the uh, Lord's Prayers Mass, and then Friday we have just a service because it's Good Friday when he hung on the cross. Yeah. And, and then nothing until Saturday at, um, at dusk. Has it always been that way in Ohio? No, just, just the Catholic Church. Well, you know, but when, when I was a kid, I went to a Catholic Church for a long time, and... Um, I don't think they did anything on Thursdays. They did on Wednesday. And then Friday, we got off of, out of school early. But I don't think we did anything on Thursdays. Yeah, it, it's, it's changed over the years. I went to 12 years of Catholic school, and we, we never had school on Holy Thursday, Good Friday. And then we they had the whole following week after Easter off. <clears throat> And I don't think we went to, I don't know, I don't think we did go to church on, on Friday, but we, had, if we got home, we had to think about Christ dying on the cross at like 12, 15 or something. Yeah. It was really intense because we had to sit and be quiet at our house, which was, oh my God, really hard. You and know, we, I went to Catholic school and we never had uh, everything that you're talking. I thought you were Orthodox there, Mark. <laughs> I did. I, mean, I, I, was Catholic, I went to Catholic school too, and I don't recall all the vigils or Catholic church, the vigils and everything. I think there must be different traditions in different places. Yeah. That's all I can figure. Well, is your, was your church pretty ethnic, Mark? Yes. Like Eastern, like, like maybe Central European? Well, it was it was very close to Byzantine Catholic, but um, okay, all right, it, it was taken over by the Roman Catholic, so it, it was Roman Catholic, but they followed a lot of the old traditions. Yeah, because that's what I was wondering if it was more because you're Slovak. Yes. Yeah, and that's what I was wondering if it was more if there were more Ethnic. people from the area, you know, Slovenia, Slovakia, etc. And that would make traditionally the traditions would be different because it from region to region. Because I know the Saint the church I went to was more started by Germans and it was more of a blend of German, Irish, and everything where I grew up. Uh, but yeah, I think yeah. that when you have a, a more ethnic, ethnic based church, for what for lack of a better word, yeah. Um, that maybe your traditions are a little different and that sounds like almost orthodoxy ish yeah yeah it was it was closer to the byzantine following gotcha and, and uh but then i also went i i went, I went mm -hmm. to seven different kinds of catholic church and learned a lot a lot of different things like you just said it's all it's all right. the, and, you know you were also close to the a lot of orthodox because there's a lot of orthodox churches 
in that area as opposed to Northwestern Europe, you know? Yeah. So. Hey, Those are cool traditions. Isabel, are you on? Isabel is. Yes, I am. I'm setting up the breakout groups. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. I just wanted to make sure that that was going to work out. Oh, it looks like the slideshow locked up. It did. It did. We're stuck on milkweed, but it's a pretty. I picture. know. Oh, but I have better pictures than that. So I also wanted to check: Are we using the same facilitators from previous breakout? If you'd like to, no. This is just casual conversation for people to go into smaller groups so they get to know new people. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought this was like one big breakout group. I was, I'm, I'm interested in the conversation that you were having. <laughs> <laughs> but, but open up everybody's mic, so I'm not the one talking. See, those are the kind of uh, conversations that are actually interesting. Yeah. That you're just talking about stuff, that stuff. I, uh, I went to two Presbyterian services yesterday, and uh, one in Pittsburgh, and one in Santa Ana, California. Oh, how about and on Zoom, <laughs> naturally. And I mean, it is just so, I usually attend on Sunday mornings. I go to the one in Pittsburgh, then do the one in California, because it comes on right afterwards because of the time difference. And it's just amazing, these two churches, how different they are. It just, uh, and they're both Presbyterian, you know. Huh. Well, that's the beauty of the Zoom presentations. You know, you could go anywhere and do a comparison and oh, to yeah. see what different groups are doing. That that's that's very cool, Brit Nancy. Well, my cousin, my I have two second cousins. One is the uh, well, one's the first cousin, but the one in Pittsburgh is the second cousin. And he's the uh, organist and. Uh, musical director for that church so i go to it he is fan he's the most wonderful organist you know he's got his phd from eastman school of music in organ and the one in california is the one my cousin who lives out there goes to and her son is very involved in their music programs so uh anyway so it's that's how i got started on the two of them and uh it's been really nice. I've really enjoyed them, but uh, both services yesterday were absolutely beautiful. I mean, the way they had them, and then they were so moving, and they would read some scripture, and then they would go into music, and then they'd come back and read some more scripture and go into music again, and it was it was quite, uh, quite moving. I really was very moved by them this year. That is funny. That is fun of uh, visiting different churches and organizations during this time where you actually have the ability to do that. Yeah. And uh, seeing how they cope with um, getting a, a choir to happen, because that's not always very easy. And usually well, they don't really have choirs, any of them right now. Uh, the one in Pittsburgh usually has one or two yesterday they had three that sang and the one in california they have they have a contemporary group and then they have the more what you think of as church group but it's only like three or four and uh so uh but uh it's they're very interesting but the churches are so different the one in pittsburgh is is very, very liberal. And the other one uh, is quite different. I apologize for interrupting. Um, everybody, you can join a room. Um, there's uh, five rooms set up and down on the right hand side of the uh, screen, just move your cursor and it says breakout rooms. And you can join one of those breakout rooms and right now, Jackie ha is the CEO president is inviting you to room two, but you can also go to any of the other rooms and, and visit with a couple of people. So what you do is you, you 
scroll down to the breakout room and then it'll show you all the different rooms you can join and talk with someone. Skillful with spears.
Honestly.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back. We'll be starting here at one o'clock. Red maples, an underappreciated flower. They are, aren't they, Jackie? <laughs> I, I found out that these are male flowers from uh, Don Cipollione, something to that effect, but he said those were males, so. Well, you can see the anthers. That's what he was saying, the anthers there. Um, and then I saw some pictures. This was on the native trees, shrubs, and vines of Ohio, a Facebook group I'm a member of. There's some, you know, there's really smart people on those <laughs> groups, but that's what they said. And then another guy posted a whole thing on all the different, um, on red maples and all the different, the male flowers, the female flowers, some branches that have male on one side, female on the other uh, yeah. side combo. I have, I'm on two different computers. One of them sharing the screen oh. and the main thing and the other was here in the break room. Uh, oh. man. What a service. Bill, we can uh, hear you. I'm we, not yeah, sure if you're Jeff. meaning to talk to the whole group. Right. But it is interesting, Jackie. I didn't know that, that they had all these different, I didn't know there were male and female flowers, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, on some, well, things, but not on maples. Yeah, most most plants have both male and female on the same flower. But yeah, I, I did not know that may, that they actually, I thought that they were just like, the, what are they called, a perfect flower when they have, they don't have separate individual male or female flowers. You know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah that's interesting actually. I, I really actually, like plants a lot. I don't know a ton about them, but I really do like them. And they're nice because they stay, you know, in place, unlike a bird that flies away. Yeah, what's funny is I, I went to school for, to major in zoology because I didn't care about plants. And then I ended up double majoring in zoology and botany. No kidding. Figured out plants were pretty cool after all. They are, you know. I think so too. I, I might, I mean, I like, I love birds and that, but I might kind of like plants. <laughs> Equal, as, They're like, easier to photograph. Pardon? The plants are easier to photograph. They are. They're so much easier to photograph, except when the wind comes. Cause you know, did you ever go to take a picture and there's nothing and then all of a sudden the wind starts blowing and it won't stop. But I, I like plants, I think just as much as I do birds. And, and there's, I don't know, just, they're cool. And I learned from Jim McCormick yesterday about the trout lily and the golden star. They're almost identical. They're in the same family. There's a few minor um, differences. And the one of the things is the flowers on the golden star, which are uncommon, don't droop as much as um, trout lilies. And then the anther, the pollen on the anthers for the trout lily are more of an orange. So those are the two. There's other things too that I don't really understand. But yeah, uh, let, let me let me break in, everybody. Um, we all the breakout rooms are closing. In fact, uh, they'll be closing in the next 15 seconds. And so. Um, we're going to get ready for the next talk, which starts promptly at one o'clock. I think we're two minutes from one. And so we would like to um, uh, sound check our next speaker, which is Dr. Laura. Dr. Laura, are you here? I'm here. Can you hear me OK? We can hear you perfectly. And <laughs> Um, at one o'clock, um, 
hopefully Bill's going to be available to uh, share your screen. If I can just share it myself, that would be ideal. Okay, Isabella, is that possible? It looks like it is. It looks like I'll yes. be able to. Absolutely. If you see the share screen uh, button at the very bottom, it's in green. You should be able to share. Just trying to find my PowerPoint here. Excellent. If everybody else could mute, and um, if not, we're going to mute you anyway. But I would like to, it's 1259. Um, we're going to go ahead and start a just a little bit early because I have to shuffle my screen to get to the bio. And Dr. Laura, Dr. Rocket, and I'm going <laughs> to let Dr. Laura tell you her last name. Okay. Are you ready for me? Um, let me do the introduction, but tell them your last name. Oh, it's Rock Attendance. Four syllables. Pretty easy. Rock Attendance. Beautiful. I'm not going to say it, but that's that's how you say your last name, <laughs> Dr. Rocket. But Laura has lived in Northeast Ohio for almost 25 years, originally moving to Cleveland to finish her undergrad degree in biology at Case Western Reserve. She stayed because of the great people and amazing outdoor recreation aspects like Lake Erie, Metro Parks, Cuyahoga Valley. She has a master's in biology also from John Carroll University and a PhD in integrated bioscience. And she's gonna to have to explain that one from the University of Akron. She recently received a graduate certificate in nonprofit management from Cleveland State University. She is on the boards of several local regional nonprofits. She is a recipient of the Cleveland Museum of Natural History Conservation Educator of the Year in 2017 and Diversity Award from the University of Akron in 2020. She is a National Geographic Certified Educator. She's gonna share a little bit about that and a Certified Interpretive guide through the National Association of Interpretation. She is currently the manager of the University of Akron Field Station. The field station encompasses three, three sites, 500 acres total, the Martin Center for Field Studies and the Environmental Education at Bath Nature Preserve, St Steiner Woods and Pansner Wetlands, I'm chopping up these names, Wildlife Preserve, her true passion is the community engagement program she's spearheading to increase University of Akron's involvement with local K through 12 schools and the general public. She is co-author of an identification book on the birds of Bath Nature Preserve. She's also a state coordinator for pollinator partnership projects, Wingspan, as well as the NRCS slash P2 liaison in Ohio. She lives with her partner, Josh, three dogs, Emma, Finn, and Cricket, two cats, Charlie and Elisa May, six hens, Bad Betty, Fergie, Cam Cam Camella, Poland, Dominica, and Barney, two turtles, Ollie and Spip, and Noisy Cockatoo, Gertie, and I apologize, all these names, I'm horrible at words because I, I have dyslexia people. So she loves gardening, hiking and crafts and all other things. I'm gonna let her talk now because there's another page you can all look at in our presentation, but here's Dr. Laura. Great, thanks so much for that nice introduction. And I'm so pleased to be here today. I really wanna um, just start by thanking Mark and um, Jim Jablonski for reaching out to me to do this talk for you all today. Um, so I, while I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about today, I decided um, that I wanted to talk about the birds and the bees. And um, before you all get too excited, I actually am too embarrassed to teach that actual topic in college biology classes. So we're going to be actually talking about real birds and real bees today. Um, and I'm just so pleased to be here with you all. So thanks again for, for having me and for um, spending the next few minutes with me today talking about um, some of these things. So you guys just heard a little bit about 
myself. Um, so the, the last thing I'll tell you is that I'm just an absolute nature nut. So I love nature. I love being outside. Um, I find that um, I'm constantly still in awe of the natural world and of um, all of the things that we can learn from nature. And so it really motivates me. I feel like I have found a job that fits my passion. And, um, and you know, the old saying that if you love your job, you never work a day in your life. It's not totally true, but you know, we'll, we'll go with it for, for now. Um, so before I get too further started, I wanted to make sure that, um, especially about birds, I'm not a bird expert. I'm actually not a bee expert either. Um, neither of those things are things that I studied in um, any of my, my academic endeavors, but I surround myself with people that are very smart about birds. So I wanted to make sure that I mentioned a few of them today. Um, Mike Edgington from, um, he's with Greater Akron Audubon Society. I like to call Mike my BF, BBFF. It's my best birder friend forever. Um, I met Mike like maybe my first week on the job at, as field station manager. And um, we've been best buddies ever since he is such a huge inspiration to me in terms of getting out there and trying to learn new things. But also, um, you know, we have a lot of fun adventures together. So Mike and Tim Colburn, who's from Ohio Ornithological Society, and Josh and I went to um, Nebraska in 2018, which I heard um, somebody else talk about their trip to Nebraska, um, to Kearney. It, it was the most magical ex natural experience I've ever been on definitely one of the natural wonders of the world, in my opinion. So if you haven't gone, I hope you get to go. Um, Mike meets us out at McGee Marsh during the biggest week in birding. Usually every year we even have brought Josh's mom and dad and grandma with us. Um, and it's always so nice to have um, somebody who knows what they're talking about when you're going birding. So if you're just a brand new birder, you know, one of the things that Josh and I love about birding um, is that everybody is so nice um, and that it's such a great group of folks um, always willing to be helpful and never make people feel bad about not knowing what they're talking about. So um, I know some people don't like going during the biggest week in birding, but we actually enjoy it um, for the reason that there's so many people there. Um, Julie West is a bird bander associated with the Nature Center at Shaker Lakes. And um, she really was, she was my spark bird. Um, I worked as the natural resources specialist at the Nature Center for um, several years before I went back to get my PhD. And I got to bird, um, uh, do bird banding with Julie and Gary Newman um, on the regular when I was there. And just getting to be up close and personal with those, um, with birds and with Julie, who again is such an awesome patient teacher um, such a wonderful time in my life, and I have such great memories of that. In fact, Josh and I's first date, a first, yeah, for our first date was like at 5.30 in the morning going bird banding with Julie and Gary. So great memories of that. And also have some really wonderful volunteers that are associated with local chapters um, like Kathy Mock, who come to help um, when I lead bird walks. And so I'm just really grateful that this birding community is such a wonderful, welcoming, friendly place and um, happy to, to be a part of it. Okay, so we're gonna talk about birds. Uh, 2020 was going to be our year of the bird um, at the field station. So we were super excited to receive in late 2019 a, a grant from um, uh, Bath Community Foundation to write a bird guide for Bath Nature Preserve and also to do something that we were calling the bird blitz. So it would be similar to kind of like Summit County's hiking spree um, where people would you know, kind of collect birds on their checklist and then be able to submit um, those checklists for prizes. Um, we started out the year in January with Mike Edgington organizing a really great team of volunteers from all over the area to do um, regular bird surveys at, at Bath Nature Preserve, which I'll talk a little bit more about. That's where our main base of operations is for the field station. Um, and then, as you all know, um, the, the pandemic came through in March and put everything to a screeching halt. So our bird blitz kind of got moved to us doing the majority of the work behind the scenes on the bird book um, during last year, but we had to cancel all of our most popular um, public outreach events. So I, I will say, um, well, let me, I'll get to that next. But um, so here's the Bath Nature Preserve is an eBird hotspot, actually has a lot of different trails 
um, different spots within the nature preserve kind of split up so that people can volunteer just to do one particular trail at a time. You don't have to do the whole property. Um, so there's like the Garden Bowl and Beefy's Trail and um, it's been split up a bit into chunks, which you can see in the map in the upper right hand side of the screen. So we've been really happy to have um, so many of those checklists being done um, and getting into um, into eBird. So if you bird at Bath Nature Preserve, please feel free to um, throw your observations in there. It's really helpful for us. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it when we talk about our book, but we did really mine this information um, from, the, from the surveys that people were doing for us. So we also have bluebird boxes and I was really inspired by um, Penny's talk this morning about her bluebird trails. Um, as you can see, our, some of our boxes are a little raggedy looking so that we're actually in the process of taking down some of our old boxes this year and replacing them. Uh, we had a really wonderful volunteer that donated handmade Peterson boxes, Peterson style boxes last year. So um, we need to go through and actually take out some of the old ones. But we've had also Boy Scout projects, um, Eagle Scout projects. So they built these um, wood duck boxes and mallard um, nest ducks boxes and prothonotary warbler houses. Um, and so we have those up at the field station. We really could use some volunteers um, to help monitor those. So if anybody's interested, I'd love to hear from you after the fact. We do lots of bird programming um, at Bath Nature Preserve. So um, we did, this year was unique for us because we did five owl prowls actually in March. Um, when I first suggested that we do an owl prowl in um, the first year that we did it was maybe 2016, 90 people showed up at the field station and um, it was before we expanded our parking lot that could fit like 10 cars. So it was a crazy um, nightmare almost. It was so exciting to have so many people want to come and learn about owls, but it was also really overwhelming that we had fit, you know, 90 people crammed into our parking lot and into our building that doesn't fit 90 people. So we had to be really creative on the fly. We split up into two groups and so they rotated in through the owl prowl um, room where they got to dissect pellets and then um, go on hikes with leaders outside of that. So we also do um, woodcock walks. We have three coming up in April. We're trying to keep our, our group sizes under 10 with our two leaders. So um, that's why we're doing multiples this year. So uh, this little taxidermy woodcock, um, we actually found dead on the road at the field station. And so we were able to, um, to pay to have it taxidermied by Maria Burke. She used to work at the Museum of Natural History. She's wonderful. She's in the process of doing a short-eared owl for us now. So um, we're really lucky to have her on board to help us with things. Um, the Woodcock Walk uh, in, in years past has attracted up, upwards of 50 people. So people are really interested in kind of doing these things. We have a the Woodcock Walk I put on YouTube last year. So if anybody's interested in checking out the, it's about um, 15 minute video on, on Woodcocks. And then we're doing three walks next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. We still have spots available for all of them. So if you are interested in attending one of them, you can send me an email at, um, at my email address, which is at the end of the talk, but just put Timber Doodle in the subject line and I'll see if we can find a date that matches up with where we have openings. We also do a lot of art workshops at the field station. I really think that science and art go together hand in hand. Some people just aren't scientific learners. Some people are very much more of the, the art brained um, visual learners. And so this was a beautiful um, linoleum cut done by one of our actual um, favorite attendees at our bird walks, um, Candace. She made this cute little owl. Um, uh, it was last January before the shutdown. So all of these things, are great at bringing in lots of people. And I know I saw that Nancy is giving lots of woodcock walks on Wednesdays through Greater Akron Audubon Society or um, through Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society. So that's exciting that um, get more people excited about that pretty little bird. So we also did um, a, to, to pivot to doing things virtually last year, um, we did, we've done this now twice. We did one called Fall into Nature and I'll show you Spring into Nature next where we made 30 signs, um, 30 temporary signs, uh, kind of like yard signs, uh, pretty big, you know, like 18 by 24 inches that we put up on stakes throughout the park last year and made a bingo card for folks that, so it was a self 
um, guided tour of Bath Nature Preserve. So they had to find all 30 signs. And if they did, they turned in their bingo card and we sent them a really nice prize pack um, when they were done. And so um, you can see we highlighted a lot of birds um, in the Fall Into Nature series. We did that again for Spring Into Nature. So we picked birds that we thought people would be seeing around now. And so really trying to get the word out to folks um, about how important birding is um, and, and why Bath Nature Center is such a special place to look for those birds. We have a bird feeder area that was put in in 2017 by the field station. Um, and those windows behind there have now since been replaced with huge picture windows. So this year we just got a grant um, from Bath Volunteers for Service to buy that Collide Escape um, tape to put on our windows to avoid um, window strikes. We get feedback from students, college students and K through 12 students um, that are coming out to the field station that watching the birds through the windows is one of their favorite things that they get to do when they are at a class at the field station. And so this has been really something really important to us. We don't use this seed mix anymore. This is when it first went up. So we're just using black oil sunflower seeds, um, but it's been a really nice addition um, to the field station and we've, um, you know, we've really enjoyed having that. And we've heard feedback that folks come and actually sit in the parking lot and watch the birds from the feeder just from the parking lot, which is really nice too. So this is really exciting. This was this is a project that was funded by the Greater Akron Audubon Society. So thank you so much. We have a long, um, a long great history with Greater Akron Audubon Society. They've held their annual picnic at the field station at Bath Nature Preserve for several years in the past. And um, they are wonderful supporters of the field station. We really could not support, thank them enough for their support. This was a, um, a specific grant that they gave us to create this artist inspired um, chimney swift tower. So this tower is um, being created by an artistic team from, um, from that's a partnership between Akron and Kent State University. So unlike just putting up a regular square chimney swift tower, this one is going to have this kind of sinuous curves. Um, this is an artist rendering of what it will look like when it's um, in place, although this is not the location that we're likely to put it. We're going to put it closer to the field station building. But you can see how big it is um, from that, that um, student standing next to it in the upper right hand side. Um, so this has been carved on some fancy machinery that these artists have in their studio. And then they coat it with a concrete like coating. It's going to be, I think, um, like almost 20 feet tall or something like that when it's done. So we're really excited about this um, kind of different way of thinking about how we can do um, habitat installations, but that also functionally have some sort of artistic um, component to them. So thank you, Greater Ad Akron Audubon for your continued support of the field station and for um, really having faith in us to try something different. So this is, you know, it's real easy to fund a, um, a normal chimney swift tower. It's another thing to give an organization money and, and trust us to do something interesting with it. So we're really excited that you've given us this opportunity. So the most exciting thing is that we put out a, a bird book this year for Bath Nature Preserve. So we are so excited. Um, and again, here is part of our history with Greater Akron Audubon Society. You can see that they had a checklist for us um, from, from 2007. So this is what I was using when I started at the field station in 2015. And we had some, we knew we had some additions. So the trumpeter swans started visiting Bath Nature Preserve in 2016, and that wasn't on the list. And so we updated this bird checklist. We now have 190 birds that have been spotted at Bath Nature Preserve that are on the checklist in the back. And then the book itself highlights um, 80 of the most common bird species that people would be likely to see. Um, with that grant money, this was funded by Bath Community Fund. We were able to buy a classroom set of binoculars. So um, you can see these kiddos are modeling them for me. Uh, we also installed within the last couple of years, a couple really nice um, nesting bird signs, permanent nesting bird signs out in the um, on the property because people do not pay attention to leash laws. And so this is something that we've really been struggling with and trying to increase um, awareness about. The great thing about this book is that we um, wrote into the grant that 100 copies of it would be funded for students within um, the Bath Elementary School system. And I just met with Bath Elementary School uh, leadership last week and they are going to buy an additional 100 copies. And so 
200 copies of this book will be going to the fourth graders at Bath Elementary School in the fall. And so we're hoping that this starts a really robust relationship with that elementary school, but also um, with those students and that we're gonna have potentially 400 or 200 new birders um, coming out of that school system. So we're really excited about that. Here are some of the pages, just so you can see how adorable our illustrator is. Um, our, the photographs are by his dad, John Landis, who also does a lot of volunteering for me. The illustrations are by a freshman at Ohio State University. So he was a recent graduate from Revere High School. And so he's done these really fun illustrations. And sometimes they combine the illustration and the photographs into one image. So we're just super excited about this. It is not a scientific book. If you are a birder that um, wants to know all the details about um, about birding, this is not the book for you. This book is meant to be fun to inspire kids to get excited about birding. So we talk a lot about um, birds' hairdos and uh, their fluffy butts and things like that. Um, so anyway, we're really proud of it. It was a labor of love. This was literally something that consumed a lot of my time during the pandemic. Uh, I wanna thank Black River Audubon and Jim Jablonski for um, awarding me a scholarship to go to Educators Week on Hog Island. So I was supposed to go last year, but it's been um, put off till this year. And I'm happy to say that I will be vaccinated and able to go. So I'm really excited about this opportunity. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of money for professional development activities like this. And, and since I told you at the beginning that I'm not a birder, um, uh, by nature, this is going to be a great opportunity for me to learn some new skills and to be able to bring those back to the students that we're going to be working with in the fall. So I'm very grateful to them and thankful for this opportunity. I was so happy to hear you all talking about your DEI initiatives at the beginning of, um, of this um, talk. We are really um, adamant that birding is for everyone. And I think that the incident with Christian Cooper that happened in Central Park um, this summer really illustrated the point that we need to be better about making sure that uh, everyone knows that birding is for them. So we, um, we included this collage in the back of our book um, that John Landis put together from actual photographs of our students um, at Bath Nature Preserve. So since 2015, we've hosted almost 5,000 students at um, Bath Nature Preserve. Here's Mike actually standing on the bench with lots of them as they're looking out over the Garden Bowl um, swamp. Um, they, um, sorry, Marsh, they, um, this has been a really important thing for us. So we are so grateful to have the support of the university to really have made this a uh, priority at the field station. So we're, we've been bringing students there on the regular except for this year. And then in addition, we've also been going into classrooms. So actually before the pandemic hit, we had seen like 750 kids January, February and March of last year. Um, and now we're starting to slowly but surely get to visit with them um, virtually. And then hopefully by May, we'll be back in the classroom again, which is really exciting. Um, this is a, a free program. It's also mostly volunteer run because um, until October of last year, I was the only staff at the field station. And so this is really, a um, you know, there might be other bigger organizations that bring 4,500 students to them in a year. But for us, this has really been um, a monumental achievement. We're very proud of the fact that we've been able to, to do this much outreach in the community for free and no charge to our partner schools. So here's just some fun pictures of kids looking at birds. We actually, um, I don't know if you all know Becky Donaldson, she's came down um, from Mentor Marsh, Cleveland Museum of Natural History to help one day with a field trip um, a few years ago. And one of the days that we, the, we had the spotting scope out at the um, Garden Bowl uh, Marsh, the trumpeter swan mom hatched her eggs and so the the kids got to see tr just born baby trumpeters ones it was so exciting it was such a great thing this is a new development that we're really excited about um fingers crossed that it's going to actually go but we've proposed to teach a class um about the ua the historical ua museum of zoology in the spring of 22 university of akron has this really unique um, format of classes called unclasses they don't have to be on the books their, um, their classes that are just one-off classes. And so we have this historic bird collection that was donated by Thomas Rhodes 
um, in before 1910, we have an ivory billed woodpecker in the collection. And um, recently, very excitingly, one of Thomas Rhodes's um, ancestors reached out to me to ask if we still had the collection and what was going on with it. So we're really hoping that this will be an interdisciplinary class between museum and library archives, education, biology, and art, and that we'll eventually be able to get some of these um, specimens, you know, cleaned and preserved and better protected and on display um, and have some art associated with that going out into the world. So stay tuned. We're very excited about this coming up. Okay. I want to talk to you next about the bees and also, of course, the butterflies. So these two pictures are from my backyard. Uh, this is a stiff leaf goldenrod, um, which is just a huge attractant for pollinators and also um, swamp milkweed with the, with the monarch and the bumblebee on it. I am not going to talk to you about native plants today. I do have another um, talk. It's about 40 minutes long on um, how we kind of transformed our very urban backyard in Lakewood into a pollinator habitat. So if any of your chapters are interested in having a talk like that in the future, I'm happy to, um, to do that. But today I really want to focus on pollinator partnership programs. Um, I work for them on a very part-time basis as the state coordinator for a couple of programs. So Pollinator Partnership is a leader in pollinator activities um, in, in Mexico, North America, Canada, you know, United States. And uh, they are the ones that put out these fabulous posters every year, um, uh, uh, the artist posters that are trying to spread awareness about pollinators. And so we, um, they really are one of those great organizations that works with a lot of other organizations to make sure that the message that they're sending is really impactful and, um, and elevated as much as possible. Why do we care about pollinators? You all are intimately involved with um, ecosystems on a, in a different way. So, and I heard some of you talking during lunch about your interests in plants um, and botany. Um, so I'm sure that you know all of these things, we're not gonna belabor the point, but pollinators are really important for our survival. So they help us make food, they give us fibers, uh, they're the food web for other species. They help with plant reproduction for plants that are doing carbon sequestration and um, stabilizing our soils. They're an integral part of this planet's biodiversity. I don't know if you all watched um, David Attenborough's special on uh, a couple nights ago on PBS about extinction, but he talked exactly about this that things don't exist in a vacuum, everything is interconnected to each other. And if we're losing species, um, we are having an impact that we don't even know about on other species. And you know, for me, a very important thing is that they, they make the world more beautiful, just like art. So our world would be a less exciting place if we didn't have all of these beautiful pollinators around. So one of the main programs that I wanted to talk to you about is Project Wingspan. This is a really, really large scale program. And so it's like within seven or nine states um, and grassroots. So this is a program that um, recruits and trains volunteers. There's an online training module to be able to identify a set of pollinator plants um, that bloom from the spring through the fall and to collect the seeds of those. So the goal is to increase quality, quantity and connectivity of this habitat throughout um, Midwestern and Great Lakes states. And the reason that this is so important is because we are a really important flyway for these things. So we collect seed, we then clean and grow out that seed, and then we spread the seed around coming back to the area through, um, through habitat restoration projects. Um, so it's really a cool approach. And I did this last year for the first time. I was uh, the state coordinator, just got that job and um, February and then obviously COVID came in March and so things were really um, truncated on how we could interact with each other. But I will say that this was the most hopeful project that I got to play a part in last year. Collecting seeds means that you believe in a future. So here is the two different um, areas in Ohio where we collect. We have a northern ecoregion and a southern ecoregion and you can also see what the other participating states are. Um, we Any seed that's collected in the green region gets cleaned and grown out for plugs and then comes back to the region as seeds or plugs. Um, so we're not um, diluting genetic diversity from our particular area. That's a really important part of this project for us. Here's a target list of common species. So this species list is great because it shows us which ones are blooming in the spring all the way down through the fall and kind of shows us this beautiful color spectrum of all of these 
plants that you might see. And so if you're looking to plant some plants in your yard that would be good for pollinators, you could look at a list like this and have a pretty good idea on um, of picking something really, really special for your yard. Um, I, I did just learn maybe just last week that like some of the iron weeds have bee specialists that only use iron weeds for pollen and they actually have white pollen. Um, and so there's like 11 species of bees that only use goldenrod. Um, for the species. So, and while we're mostly collecting um, um, if like uh, herbaceous level plants, we do collect button bush seeds here too. When you're thinking about um, doing some backyard habitat, you know, having that real layered approach of herbaceous shrubs and trees is really important. I heard somebody talking about like, look at all the flowers on a maple tree. Well, that's like having thousands or, or tens of thousands of flowers in your yard if you just have one maple tree, right? It's producing all of that great pollen early for the for pollinators when they need it. So here's where you can sign up. So you can go check out pollinator.org on wingspan slash seed collection. There's online um, training. So it's a six step module. So you go through and watch the videos. You have to do a pre quiz and a post quiz. It's relatively easy. I will not say it doesn't take time because it does everything worthwhile does. Um, so, you know, plan on spending a few hours um, dedicating yourself to, to getting involved here. But we have some great teams started in Ohio already. And this would be a great, um, a great program for your individual chapters to promote to your members as a way to do something complimentary to, um, to bird related stuff. So if you're looking for um, projects for your chapters to do, this is a really great one. And I'm happy to help get you all started um, on that path if that's something that you're interested in. Also important just to think about citizen science as a way um, to get your um, chapters involved in some stuff. So there, this um, site, Pollinator Live site has tons of different citizen science programs. So there's like Operation Bumblebee, all kinds of different pollinator related um, citizen science things. Xerxes Society has a really nice monitoring guide for native bees. You can learn more about bees in your backyard from this great book by Olivia Carroll um, that talks about all of the different bees that you might see. OSU um, has an awesome bee lab. So that's run by Denise Ellsworth. I cannot say enough about Denise or um, her program. So if you're really interested in learning more, I'm sure most of you all know about this, but ODNR has wonderful free resources on identification guides. So they have um, bees and wasps and moths and um, butterflies, but they also have warblers and um, and backyard birds and all kinds of things that you can get to use with your constituents if that's something that's interesting. And then also, um, I didn't mention it very well when we were talking about the, the e-birding hotspot, but you know, iNaturalist is becoming a really important scientific tool. So adding your own personal observations to iNaturalist is, is really great. And also there's specific projects. So my boss, Dr. Mitchell, who's a bumblebee expert, has been integral in this Ohio Bee Atlas. And as you can see, they've had like almost 27,000 um, observations of bumblebees in the state of Ohio. And this helped um, confirm that the rusty patch bumblebee is in fact extirpated from Ohio, as far as they can tell. They were not able to find a single specimen of um, rusty patch bumblebee when they were doing that particular project. Um, and iNaturalist is a great way to learn about things that you might not be super familiar with. It, the machine learning, the, I, the, the um, automatic learning through that um, site has been really improved in the last few years. So if you take a picture of a plant and you don't know what it is, oftentimes it will give you like a really good guess as to what it is. And there's other cool apps like that for birds too. So yesterday I was hiking in CBNP and I, um, I'm, I told you I'm not a great birder, but I saw a bird and I thought, I think that's a ruby crown kinglet. And then I um, recorded its song on BirdNet and sure enough, it came back as ruby or golden crown kinglet. And I was super proud of myself for both visually knowing that's what it was and catching the song and being able to verify. So really fun tools that are out there now. I'm not techie, so if I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, that's for sure. So social networks are so important. Pollinator Partnership has a great um, new certification program called Bee Friendly Farming, and they have one for gardens. So you can get this certification and a sign to put on your, on your sites. If you guys have demonstration gardens or um, like the, the Black River Audubon has that actual property, you know, signs are a great way to convey to the general public what you're doing and why. 
you know, people might see a prairie and think, man, that looks messy. They need to mow their grass. But if you had a sign there saying this is monarch habitat or certified wildlife habitat or a pollinator garden or bee friendly garden, then all of a sudden people scratch their head and think, oh yeah, I could live with that, that thing that's maybe not totally neatly manicured. Um, now that I know it's for help, you know, being helpful for monarchs and for bees and birds. So um, I just think that this is a great way to, a great easy way to communicate, to help the general public um, in a passive way kind of learn about um, what's going on at your particular sites. There's also some pledges that as individuals we can be, we can participate in. There's the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge. So you can sign your garden up and make a pledge. Um, Xerxes Society has something similar called Bring Back the Pollinators. Um, and so our voices are more powerful when they're together. So just like COAC is more powerful as an organization together than maybe your individual chapters are, um, this is the same type of thing. So if you can put your name on something that will start to get people's attention um, at the higher levels for things like um, um, legislation, that's really important. I'm not sure if you all know that the, the monarch was deemed, um, the monarch butterfly was deemed eligible to be listed um, on the endangered species list, but it was precluded by a more pressing pressing species listings. So, um, you know, thinking about, uh, well, what's more pressing than that? You know, like how do we use our voices to say, well, if it's eligible to be listed for endangered, it should be listed as endangered so that we can start getting federal protections into place for those organisms rather than having it be, you know, um, put further down the list maybe for, for a mammal or, a, you know, an organism that people value more because it's not an invertebrate. Um, you know, lots of people um, raise monarch caterpillars. There's been some um, feedback on this in the last couple of years that monarchs raised in captivity indoors don't do as well as um, monarchs uh, raised outside. They also don't get eaten or parasitized by monarchs that are left alone on your plants. Um, this is my nephew, Danny, from a few years ago, and he um, got to raise monarchs and he, he named his monarch caterpillar and then the, he changed the name when it turned into a butterfly so that was pretty cool like he really actually understood that it had changed a bit um and um you know you don't have to bring in every monarch caterpillar but if you're inspiring the next generation of um, nature lovers by letting them see this amazing um spectacle of nature happen in front of their eyes then just like a zoo, it, it has value to it. You know, you don't have to collect every single monarch from your yard and bring it in. But if you bring in one or two and share that, um, that passion for those animals with your neighbors and, and kids in the neighborhood or in a classroom, then that is a really valuable activity that, you know, that those kids are gonna remember for the rest of their lives. Lots of ways to stay engaged, especially in Ohio, there's some great, um, Great organizations out there doing really great work. Ohio Pollinator Habitat Initiative, LEAP up in my area, the Lake Erie Allegheny Partnership for Biodiversity. In the Cleveland area, we have um, seed libraries. Um, so you could go to any Cleveland um, library branch and check out seeds that then you can grow at your own home. And I know that other library systems are doing this throughout the state and the country. There's some great um, free online guides to how to, how to um, pick species for planting in your yard or how to do some planting. And also just to note, April is Native Plant Month in Ohio, an official month. Um, and so learning about native plants um, and picking one or two to plant in your own yard can really go a long way. You don't have to have a huge garden to bring pollinators in to your yard. In fact, um, Denise Ellsworth was saying about the, the ironweed, if you don't have ironweed in your yard, you won't have those 11 bee specialists on ironweed. But if you even have one ironweed plant, um, you now have given yourself the opportunity to have those 11 different um, pollinator specialists come on to your property. Pollinator Partnership has amazing free resources for download on their site. So you can get pollinator garden guides, free downloadable brochures, um, eco region guides so that you can see which plants that you want to pick for your particular area. There's technical guides. There's Be Smart Garden Kits. Um, we have a whole pollinator week um, that happens um, in June. And so look for programming around pollinators associated with pollinator week. I'm not sure what we're gonna do at the field station, but we'll figure something out. So we'll, um, 
we'll be doing maybe like a bee bio blitz at the field station so people can come learn how to use iNaturalist and borrow our insect net nets and learn how to catch a bumblebee, um, those kinds of things. So really fun things will be coming up, so stay tuned. And then um, this is my favorite picture of Mike and I from our um, trip to, um, to Nebraska. So we, you know, this information sign, Mike has a pointing at me, but quite frankly, when it comes to birds, the information sign should be pointing at Mike. Um, he has, again, I can't say enough about my friendship with him and the, the how grateful I am to, for all of his support and help over the years in really helping us um, become more knowledgeable about, about birds at the field station. Um, so here's contact information both at the field station, uh, that's the uakron.edu, at Pollinator Partnership specifically, if you want to learn about Project Wingspan or any of the other initiatives that we have going on in Ohio, like Bee Friendly Farming, you can text me on my cell phone. It's the best way to get a hold of me, actually. Um, the, the friends group, that's what um, Greater Akron Audubon Society has donated to. Our friends group, we just started, I think, two years ago, so in the summer of 2019. That has given us the ability to continue to see all of those school groups at no charge so we can pay and help students um, to get to the field station and for me to come to them and we pay for all the supplies and all of that kind of stuff. So if you are able to, to donate to that friends group, we'd love to have you. We do usually have a picnic, not this year, obviously, but hopefully we'll be getting back to normal. We have a field station Facebook page. That's where I post all our events. So if you're interested in something like the Woodcock Walks, you can go there and find out how to RSVP. And then that um, Pollinator Partnership um, website is uh, pollinator.org. So with that, I um, am happy to take any questions or, um, or chat if we have time. I'm not sure, Mark, how are we doing? We're doing great. Thank you, Laura. You're um, welcome. Leave, please leave your screen up there so everybody can take screenshots or, or with their smartphone, take a picture of it. Um, but we are also, we're still recording um, uh, this event. So uh, hopefully in the next week or two, it'll be on our, our website. So you're welcome to review uh, Laura's presentation. I know she was flying through a lot of information. <laughs> I took at least three dozen pictures. And I just hope that I can uh, keep them all uh, organized and, and why I took the pictures. But thank you for all the references. Um, uh, Scott, uh, was there any questions or does anybody uh, go ahead and uh, put in the chat box any of your questions and then Scott will uh, relay them to Laura um, and uh, we'll take like three or four questions and any other questions when we have time after the business meeting, uh, we'll, we'll uh, get Laura back on the um, uh, on the open mic so she can answer questions but um, was there any uh, questions Scott? Oh uh, yeah there was a couple one was from you Mark and that wasn't specific to understanding you were asking about a book and how to get it but it didn't say specifically what book. Okay um, that book for the children. Mm. Um, yeah so uh, we are using a, a print on demand um, um, online source so they're not super cheap to print, um, but we're also not really trying to make any money off of them. I mean, it's not a money maker for us. So we're just um, doing it to get the, the word out about birds. So we certainly could work something out like a wholesale price if you if certain chapters wanted to buy some of those, um, we could talk about it in more detail. We're gonna be doing that with, um, with uh, Hale Farm and Village. Um, they're going to be, um, buying some for their gift shop. And so we will be able to work out a wholesale part. We're just not quite sure how it's gonna work yet. We have to, we're gonna be buying in bulk um, here any day now, actually. We're, we're in the final round of edits. Uh, I was very, you know, I wanted to make sure we saw a hard copy before we bought 500 copies of something, make sure it wasn't, um, you know, terrible. And it's actually great quality. We're very happy with it. It's kind of like a flexible um, binding. So really, really like a field guide. A field book and um and um yeah we'll certainly can work something out so you just have to send me an email and let me know and then i i was going to go to the chat and dump in but my computer's a mess so i'll do it after i stop sharing my screen but i have a resource list that i made um for you all uh, mostly about pollinators there's some information about birds on there but it's mostly about pollinators 
So I will dump a PDF in the chat that you can download. Uh, it has lots of links in there for you um, to be able to access things about like the, from the pollinator partnership seed training. Yeah, I, I saw that uh, resource list. It's two pages long, but I already looked at uh, about 10 of the, uh, uh, of the references and uh, she's really done great research and, and everything that she's posted today is, is, is very good to the point specific, but she does have two more pages that she's gonna share in the uh, chat box. And uh, again, you could email her, um, but uh, cell phone chat or cell phone text is a great way to get a hold of her. She's very busy. She's going in a hundred different directions. That is true. <laughs> but she will she will take time to respond back uh, to you. So um, take this information down. And Anything if anybody, else, Scott? If anybody's interested in a, in a, like a specific talk for their chapter, please reach out. I'm I'm always happy to to do presentations. So if you had a special topic that you wanted something done on, I'm happy to work with you. Um, if you're looking for presenters, yeah. Uh, next one was Nancy Howell. Was, uh, one, Nancy Howell was wondering where you got your enthusiastic ornithologist sweatshirt. Oh, isn't that awesome? Yeah, it's so good. Um, I will have to look it up. He, I found him on um, Instagram. He's fr from England, and he um, he is an amazing artist. So he draws those images. And then he dresses up like the bird. And so he'll show the image that he's drawn and then he dresses up like the bird and he is my favorite. I love him. He's amazing. And he started the, the clothing line this year. So um, I think his company name is Birds Can Fly, but I'll find it and put it in the chat. It is great. They also, I got one for my nephew who is eight this year um, that is bright yellow and it has a puffin on it um, because I get to go see the puffins this summer and it says future ornithologist. So I get to give him that uh, next month when I finally get to see him after over a year. So I'm really excited. Thank you. Uh, next one is from Kate. Uh, where is a good place to get bee net? Oh, you know, that's a good question. I'd have to ask Randy. Um, he he would know the best bee nets to get. Um, I think he probably orders from one of the like Fisher Scientifics or something like that. Um, the, the, you know, you don't want the nylon, the old nylon bee nets that we used to use when we were kids that just look more like a fishing net almost. So the nets that he uses are cotton bags and they can be different lengths. And then some of them are very um, tall with mesh in them. So when you catch a bumblebee, the best way to catch a bumblebee is to, to gently place the net over the flower. So if you see the flower and here's a bumblebee on top, you gently place the net on top of the bumblebee and then you lift the bag up and bumblebee's inclination is to fly up to the top of the net. And so then you can um, kind of snug it at the bottom and then you have your bee in the top of the net. So um, he has ones that are real long and cone shaped and he has some with short handles and some with long handles. But so I'll ask him and see if he can put together a little um, a little note for me about where he gets those. And I can share that with you, Kate. Uh, thanks. And it looks like the last one is uh, from Nancy. And she, she asked, is the Bath Preserve handicap accessible? Uh, so that's a good question. Parts of the trail are paved. And so they would be more accessible for folks. Um, the parking lots are kind of an odd, um, like hard packed gravel. Um, I don't know what it's called. Um, it, they're not asphalt per se. They're like a smushed down gravel. Um, so we do get a lot of car birders that come and park back by the field station, stay in the car. The front parking lot, if you park in, is pretty close to the trailhead that's paved. And that trail, they actually just installed a brand new solar system walk on the paved trail. So it starts at the sun and goes all the way out um, through all the planets. It's 1.3 miles each way there and back. Um, and so that's all on the paved trail. There are some hills there, I will say. I mean, there definitely are some hills. And then the, um, the other thing is, is that we had um, a few years ago, a Western Kingbird show up at Bath Nature Preserve and it was in the interior of the park. And so folks that weren't able to um, walk out to the interior park, we just made a caravan with cars and our pickup trucks and we got people out there, uh, drove them out to uh, the site to be able to see the Western Kingbird and then drove them back because that is really important, you know, making sure people have opportunities to do that. And I think 
probably we we were able to show I don't know half a dozen more people that bird um, that wouldn't have been able to walk out there otherwise. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thanks. Actually, I I'm gonna go. Um, so I. I uh, will put those few things in the chat and then I'm going to go. I'll leave my email address in there and my cell phone number. So if anybody wants to get in touch or has questions that come up later on, um, please feel free to get in touch. And thank you so much for having me, Mark and Jim. I really appreciate both of you. And I hope you have a really wonderful rest of the day. Thank you, Laura, again. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Okay, um, we are now moving on to our business meeting. And Jackie, our... Fearless president is going to take the mic. Hey, thank you. I know everybody's favorite part of the day, the business meeting. Um, we would like to thank myself and Linda Chen. Uh, we are the two people that are rolling off the board this year. Um, Linda was our secretary, I, I'm of course your president. Um, and our terms end the end of June. So it's time to elect new people. And Mark Demian, our uh, master of ceremonies today has agreed to join the board. Um, and as our bylaws say, once the board is um, made, then the board decides who among them is the president. Um, but Mark is willing to take that position as well. Um, we do have one vacant position. So if you're interested, we would love to have you on the board. Um, our bylaw says it consists of one person from different chapters. And so we have representatives from Greater Cleveland, Western Cuyahoga, Miami Valley, Audubon of Ohio and Black River already. So if you're a member of those chapters, you're not eligible, but if you're a member of a different chapter, we would love to have you. Um, and nominations from the floor are welcome. And so if you're interested in learning more, um, you can volunteer, or put your name in the chat box so I'll get that information to you. Um, but we need to elect Mark Demian um, at, to the board. Um, the, for those positions, um, the, the order, it, oops, sorry. Um, so to be on the board, we have one board meeting a month and you join and co contribute to the conversation. Um, and then you can of course take on more duties as you um, feel the need to. So, um, so first order of business is to elect Mark Demian to the board. Um, if there's any discussion, <laughs> Mark, you don't get a discussion. <laughs> um, our bylaws say that we need we vote with one vote from each chapter. So if you are a representative of your chapter, or if you just happen to be the only one from your chapter, you, um, you can um, just unmute your microphone and say yes. And so when I call it your chapter name, please unmute your microphone and say yes or no accordingly. Um, Audubon, Miami Valley. Yes. Probably Liz, okay, thank you. Uh, Greater Cleveland? No. Mark, that's Just not kidding. it. Just kidding, yes. This is, this is serious business here, Mark. This is a business meeting. <laughs> uh, Mahoney Valley. Yes. Thank you. Um, Audubon Society of Ohio. Yes. Black River. Yes. Is Black Brook on? Canton? Is Linda on? Anybody from yes. Canton? Okay, yes. thank you. Barbara. <laughs> thank you, Barbara. Uh, Columbus? Yes. Akron? Yes. Trimoraine says yes. And Western Cuyahoga? Yes. Any, there's a few other chapters, any other chapters present want to vote? Great, thank you everybody for that. So congratulations, Mark, you have 
now join the board again. Um, you'll start the beginning of July. I uh, just want to remind all the chapters that we have reduced our sustaining membership level from $500 a year to $300 per year. Uh, your money goes to supporting these conferences. Each one of these costs about $500. Um, because they're virtual, it's a little bit less. And so that's why we're only asking $300 per year um, to cover the conferences. Uh, other fees that we pay for are like our website fees and taxes and just that stuff that you need to do to maintain a, a nonprofit organization. So again, sustaining members um, down to $300 per year. Uh, regular chapters are still at $75 per year. And we do have a half a dozen or so individual memberships. These are people that um, maybe their chapter is involved, but they really want to encourage the collaboration that COEP provides. And so um, you, I encourage all of you to individually support COAC. And a reminder that you can pay online. So you go to um, counciloac.org and up in the upper right hand corner, there's a join donate tab and um, there's different tabs for each membership level. And so you can go there and pay online and it's really easy. So I encourage you to do that. Um, Nancy, and again, I'm going to add in a little bit. This is Nancy, the treasurer of COAC. Uh, I will be sending a letter out to each chapter, the president uh, of each chapter, if not info at wherever your chapter is, regarding, uh, again, the, the uh, memberships, um, which are due, uh, our membership year ends on June 30th, so our membership year is July 1 through the end of June. And, uh, and I'm going to, again, reiterate all that's on this, this slide, as well as, again, how you can pay online. So you'll be getting something in your email. Great. Thank you, Nancy. And yeah, if you prefer not to pay online, you can contact me, contact Nancy, and we can tell you other ways if you want to pay that way. And then I want to make sure you're aware of um, an exciting little collaboration that you know, came spontaneously through COAC. Um, so the Institute of Bird Populations is trying to find support for bird banding stations in the neotropics. Um, you might have heard of the Institute of Bird Populations because they run the MAPS program, the Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship. And this is a very successful program in North America. Um, that bans breeding birds and perhaps some of you have been involved with that. It's a great and lots of publications. We know a lot more about um, population size and um, productiv productivity. So the number of fledglings that are produced each year and survival rates of different species. And, and we know that because of the MAPS program. Well, the Institute of Bird Populations wants to figure out what's happening in the winter. MAPS is a summer program. So what's happening in the winter? Um, so they're set up these neotropical sites because they want to see how winter survival of our North American birds. Um, so that bird in the upper right hand corner, the indigo bunting, they, you know, the, how do they survive in the winter? Um, so these MOSI sites were set up. Um, because many of these countries, um, you know, uh, don't need as much money, it's really easy for a couple chapters to get together and support an entire station down in the neotropics. And so they're trying to get money, it supports uh, salaries for the people, but also like gas to trans to get to the site and bird nets and banding supplies and things like that. Um, so we're getting a, a bunch of chapters together. Uh, hopefully we'll support a site in Nicaragua. Um, there's three or four sites to choose from there. And you can see the map, it shows all the, the different sites. So um, they're looking for annual support. And so, um, you know, if each chapter can support a little bit each year, uh, that's really great. Um, we picked Nicaragua um, because there's a lot of wood thrushes and indigo buntings that are banned in there. And of course, those are common birds in Ohio. Um, and like I said, it supports great science. 
you know, supports the people, but it also supports local capacity building. So training people to do bird banding, to care for the birds, to speak for the birds um, in their local areas. And um, a bunch of chapters have already gotten together um, and are pledging their support or in the process of pledging their support. You can see them listed here. Um, I guess I, I should mention that Trimoraine a couple of nights ago did pledge to support, um, add some support as well. Um, these chapters are not only um, getting a feel good for supporting this, but there is gonna be some feedback from the station. So either a blurb for your newsletter or maybe um, can coordinate an online event. Um, so anyway, there is gonna be some feedback. It's not just us sending money there. There is gonna be some feedback about them sending information and, and interesting stories for us to share. Um, so that, is there anything else you, any questions you have or anything else you wanna um, add, Sherilyn? Yes, uh, I've been in touch with Steve as late as yesterday and uh, things are kind of changing rapidly, but uh, he, he would like to um, kind of offer or alter his um, way of funding in that um, because different chapters maybe can't you know fund equally in the whole thing that instead of of us trying to decide on what one or two uh, stations that we want to fund uh, he's he's looking at being able to spread the money over over like all four of the stations that I sent out. And um, rather than, in addition to ranking them, if, if everybody could be ready to, uh, by the uh, meeting, the member COAC meeting on April 13th, um, to come up with a, a to like a, a maximum dollar amount that your chapter is willing to contribute, hopefully, on, on more than a one year basis, but we are gonna you know, see how the first year goes. And he said, by all means, uh, they do uh, intend on having um, reports and conversations so that all of our members, our chapter members can uh, be informed as to what's going on at the stations down there. So he just wanted me to relay that today. Great, thank you, Sherilyn, for that update. So if you're interested, there's still an opportunity to get involved. We haven't, we haven't reached our maximum amount, you know, and it sounds like um, whatever money we're able to give that it'll be distributed according to need. So that, that sounds great. Okay. Um, and so that's all I have for the COAG business meeting. Any questions, comments, anything um, you think we should be doing better or any, suggestions you have for um, COAC or um, gatherings, we would appreciate that. Jackie, is this a good time to mention our next gathering? I was going to mention that at the end of the Okay, meeting, but... oh, we'll wait for, you. wait for you to do that. Thank you. <laughs> um, one one question I have is, is please raise your hand if you're willing to be a representative for your chapter. What we're looking for is, uh, as you saw, we have f uh, six board members and uh, they represent their chapter, but we have a total of 14, maybe 17 chapters in Ohio. And what we would like is we'd like one representative from each chapter to be involved, to get engaged with COAC and come to our monthly conference calls. All it takes you is an hour a month and a couple of hours a, a, a year to be involved in COAC and to support and help us. So please, if, if you can raise your hand or put in the comment box that you would like to be a representative, then uh, send an email to our uh, website that you'd like to be the representative for your chapter. Uh, we really would like all 14 chapters to participate. I think today we have 10 out of our chapters represented. And uh, uh, last fall, we had 13 out of um, the 14 chapters represented. 
And again, all it takes is an hour a month to make a conference call and listen in and uh, to get involved. So thank you. Yeah, and if you uh, know of someone at another chapter who is not here today, um, if their chapter is not represented, I, I would encourage you to reach out um, because we know that word of mouth is really important. So um, talk, talk to everyone about what you learned today and hopefully you can encourage them to come to the next meeting, especially when it's in person and there's gonna be bird walks and food and it'll be great. So um, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jackie, very much. And uh, congratulations on your new position in Kansas. Uh, we're gonna miss you in, in June. Thank you. Okay, uh, our last talk this afternoon, well, second last talk this afternoon is Leanne Miller. She's the former director of development of the DAWES, D-A-W-E-S, Ar Ar Arboretum. And Leanne brings a breadth of knowledge in the strategically growing philanthropy, fostering community and corporate relationships, as well as successful, cre successfully creating a vibrant volunteer program. She has a passion for telling organization stories and using data analytics to advance philanthropy. Currently, she is a board member of the Central Ohio Association of Fundraising Professionals elect chair of the National Philanthropy Day 2021. She is also a member of the Newark Rotary Club and serves as Licking County Planning Commission and Senior Levy Advisory Committee. She is a native of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and holds a Bachelor's of Art for Temple University. Leanne lives in Grainville, Granville, Ohio with her husband, Eric and two sons, Kevin and Ryan. <clears throat> she also uh, is going to be posting her email address. Uh, welcome, Leanne, and uh, we're excited to hear about volunteer programs and what you're what you're going to be doing at uh, the Grange. All right, Mark. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be uh, with you all today. I've learned a lot of great things. I'm still learning about uh, our Columbus chapters. Um, and all the work that you do. And I've been to a few of these and every time I learn something new. We talked a little bit about volunteers today uh, throughout the whole day really. And I'm just impressed at the work that's going on um, within your chapters. And so if I repeat something, I'm sorry, but I think you guys are gonna, you know, we're all on the same page with where we wanna go with volunteers, how uh, we need diverse uh, volunteers in age, in backgrounds, um, to help further the mission and the work that uh, we all do. So um, how many of you show of hands, I'm gonna switch my screen a little bit to see, um, how, feel they have a pretty good, you know, uh, volunteer program or um, just with a sign of hands or how many of you just even have a volunteer program? Just raise a hand or... Okay. If if you can't find where it is, it's on the right hand side, all the way to the right, right on the bottom. It says reactions. That's where you can raise your hand. Great. Um, I hope that this discussion, you know, feel free to chime in at any time. Um, the best the best way to do this is if we have a good good robust discussion. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about why volunteers, right? Um, I think we often, especially from when you look at Grange, right, we, we couldn't do what we do without volunteers. They man our front desk. They take care of a lot of the grounds for us around the center. I mean, it, they help and uh, oftentimes are um, in place of, of a, a, a staff person and it really helps. But I like to look at it from the volunteer side, not just about it from the organization side, why people give. Uh, of their time and of their talents. And I think that's really important when you think about how you recruit and how you engage and get them to sign up for more than just one, one program. They give of themselves because they really care. And they're usually very passionate about what they do and how they do it. And by listening and hearing from them what excites them and what gets them going, um, that really helps with retention and the possibility of them moving up the leadership ladder. I heard today, how do we get 
you know, uh, volunteers to go on boards and it's not as easy, right? People don't want to do that time commitment, but um, listen to your volunteers, find out what motivates them and maybe um, what you have outlined has been, you know, your leadership positions for years, maybe there needs to be an adjustment. So you're bringing people on that can feel they can bring that new passion, that passion they have with them. Many hands make light work. That is definitely true at the center around our gardens. We have several groups of individuals who come out and take care of the gardens and they rotate through and, and, it, and it really makes a difference uh, just to have a staff member do that and wait on our park system because Grange is part of um, the Columbus Metro Parks. We would be waiting and oftentimes um, that just doesn't work. The plants, you know, they wanna be cut back now. We noticed that last year when we had um, COVID and staff was asked, you know, not to be out and volunteers couldn't be out well cleanup was really rough when we let it go from March, April, May, until we could finally get out there in July. And one person was trying to, to make a difference. And we have a lot of cleanup now um, because we, we just weren't able to get to it all last year. Volunteers provide much needed skills um, that help further our mission, right? Again, without volunteers, we couldn't do it. And um, I am grateful of all the organizations that I work for to have volunteers really help um, you know, move us along. I really think understanding volunteer motivation is a key indicator from some of the things we heard today, getting new people, moving people up um, through leadership positions. Um, you have to take the time to explore why they're helping your nonprofit. Um, there's a lot of words to the, to the screen there, you know, dedication, commitment, people who usually volunteer, you know, just, um, they just do it so so passionately, um, but they wanna learn. One of the things that we're learning is we have a new staff member. Her name is Rebecca Swab. She's a PhD. She comes to us from the wilds out in uh, uh, Eastern Ohio there uh, over by Zanesville. And she is, uh, the wilds is part of the Columbus Zoo and she has her PhD in ecology and our gardeners are loving to spend time with her. Um, she's not a, she's, she's a great bird. Um, uh, she'll tell you she's a, a bird fact person, but she doesn't know her birds. And we went on our first bird hike and she's looking at the plants and the things because that's what she does. And we had Allison who was um, doing the birds. And I just realized together, we just have this perfect match of these two individuals. And so um, our volunteers are excited to be working with Rebecca uh, out in the in the gardens and to learn her skills. So oftentimes volunteers want you all as birders and your specialists. Um, so volunteers are looking to come learn and further their knowledge. Um, so I just, I find that to be exciting because a lifelong learners wanna keep learning. And so that's a way to keep volunteers motivated. Uh, some individuals uh, wanna change from their day-to-day -day job. Uh, you know, if you sit behind a desk all day, the last thing you want to do is do that as part of your volunteer opportunity. That's where you want to get out, uh, do something new. Um, and so um, how, you, how you market opportunities can really make a difference. So um, how many of you, by a show of hands, take any information from your volunteers other than email address? Do you, do you ask them what their... Um, interests are, where they want to help, or things like that? Show of hands, or if anyone wants to open up the mic and comment, does anybody do that? Um, Greater Cleveland, Mark Demian, Greater Cleveland. Greater Cleveland, uh, we have a volunteer list of over 100 people, but um, we ask once a year uh, how to, um, what they would be interested in helping with, and, and a lot are in their 70s and 80s, and they would like to make phone calls for us. So we use their skills, which they would like to use. Um, and because they're quite elderly, a lot of them are quite elderly, um, their main skills are, are connecting with people. So we have them make phone calls and things for us. Oh, that's great. Anybody else? Well, if you're not doing that, I would really encourage you to have a line on whether it's you have an application or however it is you 
capture volunteers' informations to ask what they enjoy doing, um, why do they want to help your organizations, because that will really help uh, going forward. Volunteer um, engagement uh, should be, oops, I'm going to, whoops, sorry about that. Oh, wow, hold on. Got away from me. I showed you everything all in a couple minutes there. Let's try it again. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, volunteer engagement should tell a story. Um, it deepens one's um, connection to your organization. I think it inspires volunteers. Uh, it, you know, show them pictures or video or footage, share an email with them. And, you know, when you're, when you're doing your next opportunity, maybe uh, you could show a video of, an, of, of a previous um, volunteer time you all had together. Um, but anything that you can do that um, has pictures, I saw a lot of pictures this morning from um, some of the presentations. And I just, I think the more that you can show when you're recruiting, uh, what these opportunities are, and they're smiling and they're having fun. Um, I think that, that that'll help in the recruitment process. Um, it's also a great way to say thank you, especially to those who maybe missed it. You know, sometimes people just couldn't get there. It's like today, you know, people can't always meet your schedule, but if you send a, we missed you with a video, um, that might really help spur, you know, that engagement to the next volunteer opportunity. So um, I encourage if you have, it's a great um, volunteer for um, taking videos and using technology is great for that next generation to try to get involved. I'm, I'm okay with technology, but I'm always happy when a volunteer is coming in to help us, help us do that and navigate that. So here's just some people having fun gardening and being out at the center. So it always makes, always makes a difference when there's a picture. So training, um, this came up in one of our um, sessions within a room, right? You know, do you offer board training? Uh, do you offer any type of training? And training, you know, I, I was always uh, taught in the nonprofit world, the investment you make in employees, you should make it in your volunteers as well, right? There should be a brief job description, um, set expectations from both what the volunteer expects and what you expect. It makes for a better relationship. Um, be prepared for the event. Um, you know, get there early, be ready to set up, um, make sure you're ready to go and you've got all the waiver signed. Um, I know at Grange sometimes, you know, we're often um, quickly just going from one thing to the next and, and being intentional and mindful uh, of people's time so that we're ready um, makes a big difference. Um, set specific start and end times, always provide snacks. That's always a good one. People like snacks. Even in COVID, there's a way to, there's a way to do it. Um, and provide trainings for the more difficult tasks. Again, I think people really want to learn from the specialists out there. And if there's, um, like, again, I can use the garden as an example, or, or we did this a lot at Dawes. A lot of our volunteers wanted to learn from our arborist, right? When they were cutting trees and doing things. Um, and, and it was, so they volunteered to help us do the work, but they were really there to get that special one-on-one -on -one opportunity with, with one of our arborists. And, and that was invaluable, right? And our arborist was always, so happy to 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 give that one-on-one -on -one time and show them a special trip or a trick right so that they had in their pocket where they could just do it at home or share with their friends so those are really great meaningful opportunities volunteer appreciation is coming up it is the week of april uh, 18th through the 24th and i know you guys probably do you know lots of great and i know it was mentioned earlier today but Appreciating volunteers, there's so many ways to do it. You don't, if you can't do a party or you're worried even with COVID, send thank you notes. So Mark said they have, you know, some older folks to make calls, right? Ask them to also maybe do thank you notes after an event, right? You've had a um, volunteer. 
just to have them sign a card and just say, we so appreciate your time. Um, host a Zoom, another Zoom, uh, for uh, or a COVID safe in-person event. And as people are getting vaccinated, I think there's more opportunity to do some of that and be outside as the weather gets nice. If you can provide t-shirts for your chapters, let people know who they are, let them wear it out in the community. Um, I volunteer, my husband and I both volunteer and sometimes on a Saturday we're out weeding and that's the shirt we have on. And then we go to the store or something, you know, to prep for the day and people ask. So it's great advertising. And t-shirts really aren't that expensive. If you, you know, um, you can get a shirt for seven to $10. And most volunteers sometimes are even willing to help, you know, cost that back. Again, I can't stress it enough. Listen to your volunteers. Um, we're excited to um, hopefully get to our corporate volunteers. Um, that's really big for us at Grange Work Days where you work with organizations uh, to um, do a outing for their employees out. Um, and so we always listen to our corporate partners on time of day, right? So sometimes volunteers, they want evening, right? And staff will say, oh my goodness, I've been here you know, three nights this week, right? But we really have to be flexible and listen to the needs of our partners and our volunteers, uh, even though sometimes it's not the most. But again, our community partners, uh, sometimes they need to be there on the weekends because it works best for their schedule. Communication. I'm lucky. I have a staff. And so um, that really makes a difference at the end of the day. Uh, we work really well with our uh, with the Columbus Audubon uh, chapter, and we do some things in collaboration and in partnership. And um, communications really one of them, um, because the more you can streamline that that really helps send emails. Uh, create a newsletter. If you're savvy and like um, social media, do a specific only Facebook page. Um, send text reminders um, because sometimes people volunteered for something so long ago they forget. Uh, call the night before. Um, but really the best way that you can keep things going is communication, but that takes time. And that's, I know that's, that's rough. And, you know, again, if you're trying to get volunteers to do things, it's, it's hard and planning. Um, those things are really, um, you know, time consuming. How many of you have a volunteer newsletter? Does anybody do a volunteer newsletter? Oh, I see Liz. Penny, what are some of the things you share in your volunteer newsletter? Do you share birthdays? Um, actually, it's it's a vol it's a newsletter to the volunteers, and it includes information about what has happened in the program in the last two months. So it's photos that maybe where a new trail was put in, or um, monitors who helped in a certain way, or educational things that are coming up. So those are some of the things that we put in our newsletters. Great. <laughs> But there are some great resources if you track time, right? For us, we need to track time. It's really important that I give, I show um, all the volunteer hours that we're doing. And when we celebrate our volunteers, they like to see, you know, 40 volunteers did, you know, 10,000 hours. It's a, it's a big motivator. So um, we do track hours. Uh, we do that uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, just so that they know what they're doing. We to do that for some students, um, just all over the board, but that's a really good practice. And we do that through Vlogistics. They can sign up on there. They track their time on there. So Vlogistics is a great tool. There's volunteer match where you can put your profile up there. And that just is out by itself and people can connect to your organization just by match. People go onto volunteer match and say, well, I'm looking for this in my area. And um, you know, boom, your chapter can pop up and people can be like, oh, wow, that's interesting. I might want to try that out. Volunteer Hub is another great uh, tool to use for volunteers. Again, it can track um, their hours. Uh, it provides resources. There's some great articles, but um, it, it's really just um, 
again, depending on how big your chapter is, how, how much volunteer you have. But again, I think, um, you know, Grange, as, as we're starting to do some some corporate volunteers, I, I we are more than happy if, if your area, if we know, like I think of all the insurance people, right, or, or you know, um, State Farm or Grange Insurance, right, they may have an insurance agency up in your area, you know, maybe we can help connect to some corporate partners um, to help get days. Now they're one-offs, right? I don't think they're going to be long-term <laughs> volunteers, but if you have a specific project, you might be able to get a group of employees out for the day who are trying to just get out, do some good and give back to their community. So um, we will try at Grange to get a list of maybe some of the bigger companies and see if, if we can have some of their remote offices and maybe collaborate a list in, in 2022. We can, we can work on that. Um, I think that's ways that we can help as, as we have staff for this, but um, I, any questions? Um, I could talk about volunteering all day long, because again, we just, it, it just helps Grange in, in everything we do every day. We couldn't do what we do without them. Any questions? Leanne, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, could you spend a, uh, just a minute or two and share with us a, about um, uh, Nate coming on board and helping here in Ohio? Sure. Um, so Nat is the um, director of conservation for the Mississippi Flyway. He is stationed now in Ohio. He hasn't changed his job. He doesn't work for Grange. He still does his job, but he is here in Ohio um, twice, or, um, and he's at Grange twice a week, um, and he'll keep doing his things, but Nat Miller, um, we enjoy having him at the center, and um, he really works in coordination with Rebecca, our new conservation director, to look at the state as a whole, um, and I would like, if you, if you would like to tap into Rebecca's resources with her background, you know, please reach out to her. I will make sure that I give Mark some information on how to reach them. But I mean, we're here as support for you all. Um, we are all part of Audubon. We are all here in the state of Ohio. So if there's anything we can do with that to help help you guys, but I mean, you guys have your own projects and your own, um, your own, you know, your own work. So, but Rebecca is high level. And if there's anything she can do to help, just let us know. Is there any other questions uh, for Leanne? Um, you've been now at Grange how long? Um, I've been here for about eight months and we've done a little bit of restructuring. So I can tell you a little bit about Grange at the moment. We are really working to be a hub for visitor services in the parks. We have some wonderful birding and we wanna make sure that people know that we're there, that uh, we do some some great work. We want to be a conservation hub. We want us to be a showcase for backyards. Uh, we uh, want to work with advocacy. Um, we are at the state house. And so younger members really, I think, can take a role and want to play a role in advocacy and some of the work that you all do. So we're going to do some more events the way Grange used to do, I think, when it first came out. So we're reconnecting with the community and being more purposeful about the work we do and very intentional. Uh, we just started what's called the Backyard uh, Native Plant Challenge that's in partnership with the Columbus Audubon um, chapter. We have over 180 households participating throughout the state of Ohio, 36 counties, uh, some as far down as little past Dayton. And what we came up with was um, people really want to backyard, um, bird in their backyard and create natural habitats. So we've created a speaker series. You have to join. It's a, it's, you're a part of a group, a very closed group. We gave a registration period and we provided a toolkit. We uh, worked with Lowe's and some other partnerships to have a bag that has seeds in it, a trowel, a test soil kit. Um, we have all kinds of printed material so that people can plan their area. Uh, we're going to have a plant sale and we, you got seeds with, with your packet as part of your registration. They're going to lay out and show what they're planting. 
And then they're going to start documenting what came up with what they planted, what what do they see in their backyard, what what's what what's going on with the bees and birds, and then we're putting that into a data sheet, and then we will share that information. And then it's a year long um, event, and we're just people are so excited. We have some, we have native yard back challenge signs. I, I mean, it's just the people have just really rallied, and it's just fun and. Um, we've seen a lot of families um, really get involved with this. And so we just hope to keep growing it and growing it over, over the next couple of years because it allows people meeting them where they are with their, with their um, natives and what they wanna do in their backyard. So some people are gonna do some mammoth things and some people are gonna take a small little section uh, and turn it into their backyard oasis, their native oasis. So. We're just looking to do new things and um, and we're just we're we're just moving along and uh, we are starting to see people at the center and that's the most fun. We love it when young folks are coming in. Uh, we're seeing really, um, I think COVID has helped create more active na uh, nature people. And so it's fun to see 12, 13, 14 year olds coming in with their binoculars and wanting to see birds, right? They're excited. So um, we're hoping to do an after school conservation club, um, but really changing some of the things and listening to the students and having them help lead us in some of the work we're doing and helping do that. So, so yeah, so that's what's going on at Grange. And um, I'm, I'm just excited to be there. And I wanna thank Bill. Bill is a big, uh, welcomed me uh, to the center as did the rest of our board. And, um, and I've been, I've been, it's just been wonderful. And, and, I, and I just appreciate the work you all do. Liz has a question. Go ahead, Liz, unmute. Mark, I don't have a question. It might be an old raised hand. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? You're welcome to unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you very much, Leanne. I appreciate you coming in today and uh, telling us, uh, thank you very much about uh, volunteerism. Um, I know all of our chapters are struggling with trying to get volunteers, especially on their boards and especially on their executive committee. So maybe some of these ideas um, will uh, uh, propagate uh, some growth in how we uh, build our chapters and make them strong and sustainable. So thank you very much, Leanne. Well, thank you. Thank you all for the work you do to support Audubon. Okay, um, next on the agenda is the closing and the future uh, COAC activities. Um, and to be honest with you, I made the agenda and I have no idea why I put that in at 2.35. Um, does anybody on the board remember why I put that in the agenda? Well, I, I think um, after Leanne's talk, it's a good segue to announcing the fall meeting that the, um, we'll be having our fall meeting at Grange Insurance Audubon. And, um, it's a great place. And so um, if you haven't been there, you, you have to go. It's a, a sanctuary for birds and nature lovers set in the parkland created from a formerly urban and industrial site in the heart of downtown Columbus along the Scioto River. And I've been there and it's a great facility. It has, you know, you're in downtown and surrounded by skyscrapers and um, urbanization. It's this little pocket of just uh, heaven. And so um, you'll be happy to be there. And rumor has it there'll be some interesting, you know, event the night before that, you know, we'll get together at a local restaurant. And so um, anyway, there's social activities. There'll be um, you know, be post COVID. So there'll be nature walks and it'll be a great event. And so, um, and I think we have the date set. Does somebody yes. have the date? We do Saturday, October 16. I hope I've got the 16 part right. Uh, and I managed not to confuse Saturday and Sunday, but, uh, but that weekend in October, yes, on Saturday. And Jackie, to follow up on what you were saying, 
indeed, it is more than a rumor. We plan to have social activities on Friday night. Now, you may wonder about that, but one of the joys of many of the conferences that we've had in Ohio, both COAC and other, has been the ability to actually sit down and talk with, with members from other chapters, with your colleagues. And we thought that'd be a great idea, but we also thought it's a little boring to just sit down and talk like, you know, in the big room at the center. So we're gonna go drink adult beverages and have dinner, whatever, we're working on the plan, but we really do want to have social activities. Uh, on Friday night, we think you'd really enjoy it. And I tell you, if you don't spend a lot of time in Columbus, there are some wonderful things to do in Columbus and we're gonna find them and take you there. Uh, and then we also will have a bird walk in there somewhere. As you can imagine, we'll have a tour of the center. It's a fascinating building. It's a lead uh, platinum, I believe, uh, building created from the ground up as a, uh, as a uh, energy efficient place and lots of other stuff going on. By the way, by then we should have our MODIS tower on the building. We'll be talking about that too. So lots of stuff coming up at the fall gathering. Finally, uh, we are throwing together a survey on what you would like to see at the fall gathering. And that is going to be live on the COAC website. That's counciloac.org. And that by the time we close up, that should be live. So this afternoon, this evening, tomorrow, hop over there and do the survey, please. Okay, and we also have to thank everybody. So thank all of you for attending today. I, we, if you didn't show up, we would be very bored. So I'm glad you guys all showed up. Um, I would like to thank Mark Demon. Everybody give him a virtual round of applause for all his coordinating today. Um, I'd like to thank Isabella. Give her a round of applause too, Isabella, um, our Great Lakes uh, representative and keeping us working behind the scenes. Um, I also like to thank Jim Jablonski and Black River for being hosts of this virtual meeting. Uh, and of course, all the speakers that contributed to the success of this day. And so thank you all of you for your participation. I think all that's all I have. I think all we have left is, then is the memorial. Yeah, Mark, you're muted. Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> First mistake today. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. And um, Alan Dolan, who was a big part of OAC, uh, Ohio Audubon Chapters, uh, back in the 80s and early 90s, um, passed away uh, a, a while back. And so we're gonna do a, a, a quick um, 10 minute memorial and uh, three of our board members uh, are going to talk about uh, Alan and uh, maybe have a little slideshow maybe. And um, Alan was a big part of Ohio, was a big part of Canton. Uh, Alan was um, very quiet in the background and yet he was very powerful in everything he did. So I'm gonna open the mics to Bill, Linda, and Liz. Bill, do you want me to start out? Go ahead, Liz. Okay. Um, boy, it's great to see all these pictures of Alan because um, when I first met him at the, um, it was Ohio Audubon Council meetings. It was in the 80s and that is a perfect picture uh, because that's what I remember about him. I didn't take very many pictures then because we didn't have really cool, easy to use cameras in our pockets like we do. <laughs> And so it's, it's great to see that, um, but it, he was such a happy face. And of course his wife, Lee was, was incredible. 
um, when he started showing up on a bicycle, it really put us all to shame. Um, but sometimes he would park nearby and then ride his bike up there. But sometimes he traveled pretty far by bicycle to get to some of the meetings. It was really neat. He was really enthusiastic about his chapter. Uh, we always got a great report from him. And he was so helpful in helping us put together um, activities and um, programs for the Audubon Council as well. He was really proactive about things. If um, things got cont contentious or out of sorts, uh, he would be in there with either a funny quip or some voice of reason and get us back down into a productive business mode. Just a great fellow. Um, the kidding around was hilarious because he always had some wry things to say about birds and nature. And he sure did enjoy coming to those meetings and enjoy talking about his chapter. And that was really one of my favorite things about him. Um, he's one of those guys that when I reach the next life, I hope I'm on the trail with him. That's mine. Thank you. Well, this this is Bill. And yeah, I was I've been trying to think, what was I going to say about Alan? Uh, and a lot of you folks, maybe all of you knew Alan, uh, many of you heard of what he did. And I kept thinking, I can say a lot of about Alan's wonderful qualities and everybody knows that already. And it was in some ways kind of boring. I could just try to think of what could I say? I can't follow Liz, she covered all the bases, but I'll just say one anecdote about what Alan was like to me. Uh, as you know, I just finished uh, six years as your representative, representative the regional director on the National Ottoman Board, and Alan was my predecessor. Um, and I've already said in, in various venues how Alan helped me uh, just grease the skids, made it so easy for me to pick, pick up where he left off. But, you know, the one thing uh, I think of is um, at the convention, I guess it was 2000. 18 or 19, wherever, I can't, I lose track, in Utah. And I was flying out to Utah and I'm gonna get a taxi or a limo or something or other to get me from the Salt Lake Airport up to Park City, which is like a half hour drive or something or other. And Alan heard about that and he said, don't worry, we'll pick you up. Said, but Alan, you're already there. You know, you don't have to drive down to Salt Lake. You know, it's like a half hour each way or something. No, nah, we'll come and pick you up, you know, he and Lee show up picked me up, we went and had a wonderful lunch, I got up there, and rather than kind of walking into the conference kind of frazzled from the last bit of the journey, it was like, wow, I'm coming in just fresh and had this wonderful lunch, had a great chat, and that's just Alan all over, all over and over and over again. That's the kind of guy he was. So Alan, um, you know, wherever you are, thank you again. And um, I'm trying to pay it forward by doing what I can, as all of us should. Linda? Oh, Linda, looks like you're on mute. I'll help you. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm off mute now, but I was picking up where uh, um, Bill left off in regards to driving by out of your way. They went, there was a guy from Canton that moved to Arizona and he was with Stark Parks and Alan knew him really, really well. And they were out there visiting or traveling and um, they drove quite a ways out of their way to go visit, uh, Nick Morris was his name. And when they went, they took him because he left here, they took him field guides and all these different gifts and they took him out to eat. And he said, that was one of the, it was a really a big surprise in his life but he said that's one thing that he'll never forget because he moved away from here to a strange land and they bring all this information so he can kind of find his way in arizona but they did that all the time they were always driving out of their way uh to go help somebody but alan i, I never saw him like upset i've never saw him get angry or outwardly upset anyhow he was very very a, a very pleasant, happy person. You know, he was at Canton 
because they, I think a lot of you knew he was president for about 30 years and really it was his persistence that kept Canton Audubon from becoming one of the Audubon casualties actually the way I, I kind of see him but he was you know he was on the local board of the Wilderness Center which is from the Wilderness Center he jumped into Canton Audubon and he was on the Wilderness Board Center since oh 77 and he was on the Stark uh, a Friends of Stark Park board too so he was really kind of a, a big fixture in Canton, the Canton Stark County area as well. And, you know, he did a lot of work. He did uh, raised a lot of money. There was the birds of prey cages that everybody was standing in. He was responsible really behind that whole effort to raise the money for the new cages that were put up at the Wilderness Center. He just, um, you know, he just did, he was very, very passionate about, about nature and about the environment as well. So he, um, he's really, he's really, really missed here. He was just a, a really important figure in the, I think the, the, the environment, environmental world, the natural world, the bird world, and just in general as an overall very, very nice person. Yeah, and, and this is Bill once more. I, I can't resist pointing out uh, as these pictures go by, you may have noticed the one where Alan and Lee are in the church. The minister is up there blessing their 50th wedding anniversary. And what's going on with Alan? He's leaning back and laughing. Right. That was Alan. The smile was always there. Right. Good fellow. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, the three of you. Um, I've known Alan for 37 years, and the first time I met him was down at the Grange. And um, he goes, oh, you're in my neck of the woods. And I says, oh, I'm from Aurora. And he goes, well, I'm from Canton area. I says, oh my gosh. And from that moment on, Alan was always there for me. Uh, I became president of Greater Cleveland and I always had questions and Alan would take the time if I called him and said, hey, I have just a quick question, I know you're busy. I talked to him for two minutes with a question and then he talked to me for an hour about other things to help me with my chapter. And uh, Alan was always willing to help anybody and everybody. Um, Alan, um, I know you're in a better place. You're pain free now, but we're very happy that you were part of our lives. Dot, would you like to say something? Yeah. Unmute her, uh, Isabella. Yes, I'm trying. <laughs> Go ahead, Dot. Yeah. that work yes dot your your mic is open no no she's still muted. Oh, man. she's pushing the button and and, and uh isabella's pushing the button you're good That's don't touch nothing dot go ahead and talk no i'm still muted Doc, you want to try to unmute yourself? She's, she's unmuted okay. now. Okay, we're good. I would like to know the background of Bill Heck's photograph. Is it an old canal? Oh, <laughs> yes, it's one of the canal locks. It's in, I believe, Canal Winchester. And yep. it's, it is indeed one of the old canal locks. Um, yep. All these were built just in time to be made obsolete by the railroads. So, <laughs> exactly. Thank you. You're welcome. Winchester. Okay, uh, anybody else? Uh, it's open mic time. If you'd like, raise your hand and then we'll unmute you. Nancy? Yes, uh, I was also part of the old OAC group. And uh, oftentimes, you know, for me to drive down there by myself, uh, Alan would call and say, hey, are you going? And I'd say, yes. And he'd say, well, you wanna meet me in Maslin? We can park your car at this uh, oh, a big parking area down there. And so we would drive down together to the OAC meetings. And uh, it was it was so enjoyable to have the time with him and the talk. And uh, 
it's just been a hard time. But, uh, you know, when I heard it, I was, well, it was shortly after I had lost my husband. So, uh, you know, it, I'm sorry. I get emotional. <laughs> well, you know, talking about Alan, and I sent these to, um, to um, Bill, he was like the keeper of the record. You know, he had all this stuff on Canton. I mean, I've got boxes here that Lee gave me from information from, Al, uh, from Alan about Canton, but there's also COAC, well, OAC stuff. And there are brochures that I um, took photographs and sent them to Bill. And here we have brochures from, geez, way back when that, that uh, Ohio Audubon published about owls, about raptors. Can you remember all the ones that I sent you, Bill, or not? Raptors, um... So anyhow, we do have historical records of publications that we actually, our predecessors, um, did put out. I, I was totally amazed. I stumbled upon that completely by accident. So yeah, so we do have some historical records thanks to Alan and hopefully you guys will be able to get to see these brochures at some point. They were actually pretty nice. They were, I remember those too. And uh, I think I may have some around here somewhere oh, yeah? too. Oh. But I, I think I was in one of those pictures with Alan when they were going through. I don't, you might've. It was, the person was too heavy to be for Lee. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, where it was sort of looking down at a table. He was okay. pointing out oh, something. Believe, you know, I believe. I think that, that was me. I believe it was. Yeah, I do too. I, well, we're going to be. I will get that photo and send it to you. Oh, yes. that would be very well, nice. Thank it you. It looks like Laura's got her hand up. Yeah, yes, I'd like to say something more about Alan too. And I don't think Linda uh, mentioned this enough. Uh, as she said, Alan was president of Canton Audubon for 30 some years. Uh, the first few years were off and on. He'd be president, somebody else would be president, and then he'd have to do, take it over again, and then somebody else would do it, and then he'd take it over again. And eventually it just got to the point where everybody just said, you do it, and nobody would do it for 20, 25 straight years at least. Uh, he had it all himself. Um, but it has taken, since he passed away, it has taken so many people to fill his shoes just yeah. in the Canton Audubon organization. Uh, not only all the years that he served as president, he was the sole editor of the newsletter, which it has now taken a committee of several people to fill his shoes up just doing the newsletter. Uh, he was the historian for the club. He was chairman for almost every committee that, or anything, that, any project that the Canton Audubon ever wanted to take on. He, he led the way on that. Um, I can't even begin to name all of the roles and jobs that he filled. And for so many years, he wanted to retire as president for several years. But nobody felt they could do the job as well or was willing to try until Linda came along. And thank you, Linda, for stepping in and giving him a few years at the end that he could spend more time traveling with Lee. Uh, he would not have been able to do that if Linda had not stepped up to the task. Um, so, yeah, I just want everybody to realize what a hole he has left in the hearts and the minds of everybody at Canton Audubon and throughout the state. Absolutely, Laura. Thank you very much for sharing. And thank you everyone else for also sharing. Um, everyone made me realize how much I wish I had known him. <laughs> really, really feel like I... Yeah, you, miss, you missed a great opportunity, that's for certain. He was one of a kind. He can't, I don't think he could be... Re reprogrammed anyway. Thank you. Absolutely. And thanks for the memorial, uh, everyone. Um, a couple of cleanup notes. Uh, we're going to be having a survey for you to answer some questions about today's gathering. 
and also what you look forward to in the fall. As you heard uh, the full of, of energy from Leanne and Bill, uh, Columbus is going to co-host the fall gathering with the Grange. And uh, please communicate with us uh, via email, uh, any way you can, you can call us. Uh, if you need my phone number, I can get it to you. Uh, uh, but send a question to info uh, COAC, uh, Jackie, there she goes. Thank you, Jackie. See, she's my backup all the time. Uh, Mark, Mark, wait, there's no need to send the info. We have the survey online. If you go on the counciloac.org website, uh, look under COAC News, the very first item you'll see will be our survey. So please take the time to fill out the survey so that we can improve and, and make this more exciting. Uh, we had 30 people uh, show up today out of the 39 that signed up. And um, so I thought we had a pretty good gathering. I think we had 10 chapters represented. Um, and so uh, any, any other quick questions? We got uh, four more minutes. It was a great program. Thank you for everybody that, um, you know, had input in it. I thought it was a good program today. Thank and you sorry much. about the voting thing. I clicked on Dr. Laura's PDF. And when I clicked it on, I, I still could see everybody in the little squares, but my screen came down and I couldn't unmute myself. And I, it took me a while. I finally have it back up now, but anyhow. Hey, quick, quick, quick question. Um, this, the breakout breakout rooms. Did everybody like those uh, at lunchtime and at 11 o'clock or 1130? Yeah, do a thumbs up with your hand or down. You know, Mark, I, I'm not a fan of uh, breakout sessions, but this was great today. It's really, I really, uh, I really enjoyed the one I was in and it was very productive. I think it was about the right length too. It's about right. the right length. And we had the right size. There was only, uh, well, when Mark was there, there was five, and then he had to leave. There's just four. Four or five is a great size for a breakout. Usually uh, at meetings, they're like eight or 10, and you know they get a little, I don't know. They lack direction, I guess. And Penny, I think, is still here. If you have any Bluebird questions, I think Penny's still here. She can open her mic. Yeah. If you have any questions on Bluebirds or, or want more information, again, we're, the recording will be available later today or tomorrow or Monday because of the holiday. But uh, Penny's still here, so if you have any questions for Penny, you can ask her them now because we have three minutes left. And I'll put my email in the chat room if anybody wants to email me something. Too. Be good. Will the recording be on the COAC website? It will be, although it will take several days to get it there. All right. Good. You know, one I'd thing like I to wanted, wanted I'd to mention about our Bluebird program is I've been involved with it for maybe seven years or so, not seven or eight years. And I'm constantly learning new things that Penny and Fritz brand down to for that program. It's amazing the amount of work they put into it. And the program, the the quality of the program shows it. And I think it's one of the thank best you. in Ohio. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> and you've been part of it. So thank you. The volunteer is what makes it. Very good. small part. Yeah, thank you. Well, Mark, you're muted. Um, Penny and <laughs> second mistake today. That's okay. Uh, Penny um, told me that uh, some uh, bluebird nests have already dropped eggs, and uh, uh, <laughs> excellent. Is that early? Yeah. Okay. Well, we we see that homes sometimes private homes the bluebirds that are a little bit more. Uh, benefiting of being fed and they have ready water and a little bit more protection. So these are private landlords who, um, two of them that I know of that have active nests already uh, with four eggs in, in the boxes. Yeah. I've got one beautiful nest right now, Penny. <laughs> cool. <laughs> no eggs yet. I'm waiting, but it's, it's a gorgeous nest. Yes, I'm excited. <laughs> 
Thank you all. <laughs> Okay, um, okay, we're gonna we're gonna take an ending picture. So if everybody could uh, uh, start their video, and somebody magically is taking screenshots for me. <laughs> oh. Okay. Five, ten, fifteen. Thank you very very much, everyone. Have a great evening. The sun is out here in Northeast Ohio and uh, hope you all have a happy Easter and a beautiful spring. Get out and enjoy the birds and nature. Mark, thanks for all the work you've done. And yeah, Jim thank you, and, Mark. Will, and Jackie too, thank but thanks. Yeah, thank it wouldn't have happened without you, Mark. Yeah, I know. And Isabella, thank you. Yes, and Isabella, no. where's Isabella? Isabella, she she is she is the utmost. And, there she is. She's taken time from her day. Yeah. Uh, so I'm thank you, thank you, Isabella. If if every state was lucky enough to have you helping them again, thank you. And you, you'd wait. have more shirts, Isabella. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. I certainly uh -huh. don't need more shirts. Um, don't um, don't. <laughs> But um, I wanted to say congratulations. I think this is your third virtual COEC meeting or second if I'm counting right. So congratulations. Um, I think this is such a great turnout and such a great community here for Ohio. So congratulations again and have a great weekend. Thank you. You Thank too. Thank you, Isabel. And Jackie, we're going to miss you. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, we definitely are. Well, I only promise to be president if I could have constantly talked to her on a regular basis. So we're all invited out to Kansas. Yep, come on out. There's lots to see in Kansas. It's not all flat. <laughs> be safe, be healthy, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Take yeah. care. Bye, everybody. <laughs>